This are we conference good? will now be. We're good. Okay. We're good. Okay. So thank you for joining this morning. Um, this is the Oregon State Board of Agriculture meeting. Uh, today is Wednesday, December 2nd. I am the board chair, Stephanie Halleck, um, and the meeting is now called to order. Um, we're going to start by asking um, our staff to the board, Carla Valnes, to run through some administrative instructions for everybody on the call. Good morning, uh, everyone. Um, we'd like to ask, please, that um, if you're joining us, uh, by video conference this morning that only board members and presenters use their web camera. Um, we'd also like to remind you to please put your mute, your phone and your computer audio on mute to avoid some unnecessary background. Um, and also would like to remind you that our uh, free meeting materials are available on the ODA website at ODA Direct oda.direct slash board agriculture if you'd like to um, reference those documents as we move along today. Thank you. Um, and then I don't know if you mentioned this, the meeting is being recorded. Okay. Um, well, first of all, before we start our introductions, I would like to congratulate Brian Harper and Luisa Santa Maria for being reappointed to the board for a second four-year term. Um, we're glad that they are continuing on with us. Um, and I would like to welcome Elon Miller, who is a new board member, and Josh Zielinski, who I can't tell yet if he's on. Carla, I don't know if we need to text him and see if he's having any technical difficulties since this is his first meeting. Um, but they are our two new board members, and we will hear more from them during the introductions. Um, I'm going to ask Carla to call the roll for introductions. And if, for the benefit of Elon and Josh, if each board member, in addition to giving your name, will say uh, where you are from, um, that would be helpful and what you do, if appropriate. And um, I'll start. And again, I'm Stephanie Halleck. I am from the Portland metro area and I am one of two public members on the board and I am completing my last year of eight years on the board and I'm the board chair. So Carla, will you take the roll call from there? Yes, good morning, uh, Barbara Boyer. Good morning, Barbara Boyer. Um, I am chair of the Soil Water Conservation Commission and I'm a grass hay grower and a small CSA farmer out of rural Yamhill County. Brian Harper. Hey, good morning, uh, Brian Harper here. Uh, uh, member of the board and farmer in Junction City. Shante Johnson. Shante Johnson, a uh, member of the board representing small producers. Um, I farm in Corbett, Oregon, and um, do mixed vegetables and CSAs. Grant Kitamura. Hi, excuse me, I'm Grant Kitamura from Ontario. Um, I'm an onion, commercial onion packer and uh, shipper. And uh, you know, on the board, I think it's my, it's my first term, and I don't know how much longer I'm gonna be here because uh, I can make an announcement later. Alexis, but uh, uh, my, my, I've been a full-time uh, uh, resident of Oregon, but that'll soon change. Thank you. Marty Myers. Tyson Raymond. Tyson Raymond, dryland wheat farmer in northeastern Oregon near Pendleton. Luisa Santa Maria. Good morning, Luisa Santa Maria, public member, uh, work at the Oregon State University Extension. Elon Miller. Yes, Elon Miller. I'm a wine grape grower and hazelnut grower down in uh, Umpqua, Oregon. Josh Zelinski. Hi, I'm Josh. I'm a nursery and farmer in Salem, Oregon. Director Taylor. 
Hi, good morning, Alexis Taylor, director at ODA. I'm also an ex officio non-voting member of the board. Dean Sams. Hi, I'm Alan Sams. I'm Dean of the College of Agricultural Sciences at Oregon State University, director of the Oregon Ag Experiment Station, and also an ex officio member. Uh, thank you all. Um, I'd just like to remind you that we have about 30 uh, people online this morning and just a reminder if you would please use the chat box as a sign-in sheet that will be great um, I think we're ready to go Stephanie so Carla you have one other note here on asking people if they're joining by conference call only do you need to make that announcement yes thank you do we have anyone on the phone only and if so would you please uh, take a moment and introduce yourself Uh, Les Rewark, resident, uh, farmhand in Gillum County. Thank you, Les. Any others on the phone? Uh, yes, Mark Ellsworth, Duncan Family Farms. We grow organic vegetables in the Klamath Basin. Thank you, Mark. Any others on the phone? Okay, I think we're good to go. Um, oh, and I want to remind everybody to, uh, since we're being recorded, to please try and remember to state your name for the record uh, before you speak. Um, I, we know a lot of the voices, but still it would be very helpful to Carla, I'm sure. So the first order of business is approval of the minutes from our last meeting. Do I have a motion? Barbara Boyer, I so move. Is there a second? Grant Kittimura, I second. Thank you, Barbara uh, Boyer has moved approval and Grant Kittimura has seconded. All in favor of approval of the minutes from the last meeting, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes are adopted. All right, uh, Director Taylor, I think you are up for the director's report. All right, thank you, Chair Halleck. Good morning, everyone. Um, so first I want to start with some uh, housekeeping. Um, Carla, can you put up the previous organizational chart just to set reset everybody to where we were so I can talk about what looks different now? So as some of you, while she gets that, um, as some of you might know, Jason Barber is retiring um, at the end of this year. Uh, and while we're very sad to see Jason go, uh, we um, uh, are very thankful that he is giving us a lot of lead time to really be able to think about what to do um, with ODA in the short term and maybe midterm. Um, while we uh, on how to organize ourselves. So this is just really brief high level what our organization chart looked like. Uh, you can see the five different uh, program areas where things most of the programs are organized under. Um, and we won't spend much time on this one. So we could actually just I just wanted you to kind of see what we look like to see what we are shifting towards. So Carla, you can actually pull up the new organizational chart. So after we really looked at um, our budget, potential budget, future budget constraints that we might have, uh, Lisa really led this effort. She sat down with our management team to really talk about um, holding that program director position open um, and then uh, to give ourselves really flexibility um, and to really be able to uh, maintain our current workforce and continue to provide what we hope is excellent customer service. And so I, we've highlighted kind of the pieces that um, have moved based upon um, um, leaving that program, the internal services and consumer protection program area, uh, program director open. Some of the biggest things is Steve Harrington, who uh, I know many of you know, um, his programs that he oversees, weights and measures, motor fuel quality, um, et cetera, uh, is going to move under just Paulson in our market access and certification programs. 
our laboratory services um, and predator control will move under uh, food safety and animal health programs uh, under Isaac Stapleton. Um, the wolf compensation program, um, or excuse me, wolf depredation compensation program will move um, up under the director's office. Uh, and then one of the largest changes is we created a business operations manager. Uh, some of you may know uh, David Lane, who was our marketing manager. And so under this restructure, um, we have um, put David as that business operations manager. Uh, you might not know, but Jason did so many things for us at ODA, um, from fleet management to being that main point of contact and building management. Uh, Jason has really managed um, making sure we have um, getting PPE out to our staff through COVID, whether that be hand sanitizer or masks. Um, all of those types of activities. And so those will now be falling under um, uh, uh, David Lane as a business operations manager who is reporting to uh, Lauren Henderson. So just wanted to share what this kind of looks like, a little bit of our thinking behind it. But ultimately, again, we don't expect uh, our customers to really see a change um, in the staff or the programs that they're interacting with. Um, and so customer service is still one of our core values as an agency and a core focus for us. As I mentioned, we're really sad to be losing Jason. Um, he has done so much for us as an agency. He has been an invaluable part of our exec team since I've been here and I know well beyond that. But um, we're also very happy for him as he moves into the next chapter of his life and excited for that. Thank you, Carla. You can take those down. Um, next, I wanted to provide a short uh, COVID update since uh, obviously um, I know we've talked about that pretty extensively at the past couple board meetings that we have been virtual. Uh, so we continue to work with OHA and Oregon OSHA uh, to respond uh, to food processors and farms who um, have employees who test positive for COVID. These are those playbooks I had talked about briefly uh, or briefed you about in June. They're consultative, consultative in nature. And to date, we've done a little over 200, whether that be proactive, um, somebody uh, facility or uh, operation calls us up before they have any positive employees to make sure they're deploying the best um, 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 strategies to mitigate and, uh, and uh, the uh, spread of COVID or um, after they have positive employees. And so that work continues to uh, be ongoing. Uh, one of those instances um, where the playbook has been activated recently, which I know we shared some in, uh, information initially with the board already was on a mink farm. In addition to the staff who respond to uh, the playbook uh, when it's activated, uh, we also had our ODA state veterinarian, uh, Dr. Ryan Scholes, involved. Um, with the possibility for humans to spread COVID-19 to mink, Dr. Scholes uh, has been reached out early and has been in very regular communication with our mink farms in Oregon. Uh, he focused, a big focus of those conversations uh, were about increased biosecurity early on, uh, which is basically measures uh, aimed at preventing the introduction or spread of infectious diseases uh, to animals. This is actually a core part of our mission, uh, and in particular, a core part of what um, our state veterinarian does every day. Uh, I will say that we did ramp up those discussions with the mink industry with information on COVID, information from the CDC and USDA, um, including the uh, use of enhanced PPE beyond just the basic face coverings. Uh, once the farm notified us that they were having mink with some mild symptoms, uh, Dr. Scholz immediately put the farm under quarantine, which, which essentially means uh, no animals or anything associated with those animals, manure, equipment being used with those animals can leave the farm. Uh, and he did this before he even tested those animals. That quarantine will stay in place uh, for the farm until we have, uh, what, two rounds of tests which come back negative. Um, there are many zoonotic diseases which are reportable to ODA and the strain of COVID-19 in animals is one of them. In those instances, there is a normal uh, order that we kind of follow and, and that is we issue a quarantine, which we did immediately. We conduct an investigation, we 
collect diagnostic samples, we test those samples. Um, the initial test uh, on from the samples from this mink farm uh, were done by um, OSU, and then those are confirmed uh, once um, those uh, come back as, as I understand it, they can't say something's positive, they can say it's negative or not negative, and then um, the USDA National uh, Animal Health Laboratory confirms that they are positive. Um, and so those had happened, once we had that confirmation from uh, USDA, we had uh, did the press release, which I know we shared um, with the board. Um, and so once we have those positive test samples, then we work with uh, the producer on control measures. And that can look a couple different ways. Uh, a couple common ones could be, depending on the disease, it could be a round of treatment, or in this instance, it's a quarantine and test. And so again, I mentioned we will um, test the animal, a, a select sample of those animals um, starting potentially as early as next week. Um, and, and the quarantine will not be lifted until we have two rounds of negative tests from the sample, the statistically significant sample that we um, collect. I just want to mention that I, I know I said this is a really a core part in of our of our normal business at ODA. Um, as of yesterday, just for context, we actually had five total quarantines currently going on in the state for different uh, animal diseases. Uh, also on the COVID track, the food security and farm worker safety program was uh, wrapped up um, at, and we have been working uh, on finalizing. We, uh, we, we worked, if some of you may remember, with the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board to actually manage the reimbursement side of the program since it was much more in line with their, how they operate and the tools that they had at their disposal. Uh, working on wrapping up final payments uh, to producers and we're working on a final report uh, which we will share with the board. Um, uh, Maida Lostgarden and myself, she made as the executive director at OWEB and myself will be testifying before House Ag at legislative days uh, and we'll make sure the board, if there's interest in watching those testimonies, um, get a information on, um, on that. And so, and we'll, again, we'll make sure uh, we get you a copy of that report. And then finally, I just wanted to uh, again, highlight the great partnership that we've had with OSU Extension in getting face coverings, face masks out to our food processing and agriculture community. We've done this a couple times from spring to su through summer. Uh, we recently were able to procure an additional 3 million KN95 masks for the agriculture community, um, where we have um, staged them at OSU Extension and a couple ODA regional offices. Um, so producers, food processors, uh, fishers can come and collect KN95 masks. Obviously, we know that is one of the number one things we can do to um, slow or stop the spread. And so just a big thank you again to Dean Sands and OSU. It would not be possible without extension. And so thank you so much. And I will wrap there because I've gone up over. Okay, and uh, just for Josh and Elon's benefit, OWEB is the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, if you did not know that. So thank you, Director Taylor. And then we'll move to Deputy Director Hansen, who is going to give us uh, budget updates. I guess, I'm sorry, I should say, were there any questions for Director Taylor before we move to the budget updates from any board members? And I wanna remind others who might've come online to go sign into the chat function and uh, note that you are listening in. So Carla has a record, thanks. Any questions for Director Taylor? Okay. I have a oh, question. Barbara, so um, uh, Director Taylor, so David Lane moving into the business operation uh, role, What? How are you dispersing the marketing amongst the others? I couldn't really tell from the graph. Thanks, Barbara. Great question. Sorry, I didn't cover uh, that. So how we have structured it is that marketing team now is going to be reporting directly to Jeff. Um, Jeff had been David's um, supervisor. And so now, as you see it, um, Jeff has a couple senior managers um, under him as well. So Casey Prentice is one of them. Steve Harrington now is another to work um, to help manage those programs. And Jeff will be directly or is um, directly supervising um, that marketing staff. Thank you. Any other questions for Director Taylor? Okay, Deputy Director Hansen, tell us about the budget. 
Well, good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Um, I'm going to do just a little bit of background for our new board members so they understand where we're at in the process. Um, we submitted our agency request budget for next biennium back, I think, around the 1st of August. And then the work was done for the governor to create what will be what is the governor's um, budget that she's proposing to go forward that was announced yesterday publicly and then the next step of the process will be the legislative process which will give us ultimately what we'll operate under for um, the 21-23 biennium um, when we developed our agency request budget we were well into covid as you all remember and you may remember our last conversation um, wasn't very rosy I think is the, is the best way to put it for all of you. Uh, we had done a lot of uh, reduction options. We'd taken significant cuts because the lottery funds had fallen off and we didn't. We were concerned we weren't gonna have funds come in. So we changed how we did our insect pest prevention management trapping over the summer. We moved our weed staff over into our hemp program, which was a more stable funding source. Um, there were just, there were a lot of moving parts and pieces. Um, during, I think it was September, the second special session, um, there were some significant reductions taken from our budget um, when the legislature met on the general fund side, you know, to make, make ends meet. Um, I think what you'll see is as we develop the agency request budget, we tried to create continuity between the changes that we made for the 2020 COVID year and the financial situation that we were in. And those carry on into um, much of the governor's recommended budget. So a couple of things, it, I'm gonna speak really high level about this because it was just announced yesterday and we're still trying to tease apart um, some of the reductions, especially in the natural resource area where it's pretty complicated. Um, so Andrea Boyer is, on the line and she's from our budget shop and can help in Lauren and Alexis. Um, please feel free to chime in because I think this is the first time we've tried to do one of these virtually um, with a complicated budget conversation. So anybody, any help anybody wants to give me, it's all welcome. Um, so to start out with the numbers that we're looking at and trying to compare to right now, and I can just give you some general numbers. I had Andrea do a, a tiny bit of work to be able to give you a sense of where we're at for the 1921 biennium. And we use the legislatively approved numbers. So this would have all the reductions that were taken in September in that special sec session. So they're lower than what we had at the beginning of the biennium. So it makes it look like when I talked about the high level governor's uh, recommended budget number, like we're seeing increases in several areas, but actually we have taken cuts overall from where we started at the beginning um, of the current biennium in 2019. So in terms of overall general fund, the governor's recommended budget actually has us um, at about 26 million. Um, today at legislative approved is about 23, 24 million. So there's a little bit of an increase there. Uh, on the lottery fund side, which supports many of our natural resource programs, especially um, our plant programs, um, our legislatively approved budget is about 10 and a half million. The governor's budget has us at about 8.8 .8 million. So a reduction on the lottery fund side. And I think that reflects um, some of the uncertainty around lottery funds given what's gone on with bars and restaurants and people being able to play the lottery. We're still not sure how all of that's gonna impact the funding overall longer term. Um, in terms of other funds, those are fees for services, licenses, registrations that are paid by um, users of our services to the department. Um, the current legislatively approved budget is at 75 million. And the governor's recommended budget has us at about 80 million, so an increase there. And then finally, on the federal fund side of things, it's, it remains about flat, uh, 17 
million is our current um, budget level and the governor's recommended budget is is just a 17 million it's a couple hundred thousand short of what it is in in the big numbers so overall um the total budget numbers we're operating at today at about 127 million um, the governor's recommended budget has us at 133 million and then in terms of positions there is a loss of positions of about 10 positions in the governor's budget and in terms of fte it ends up being smaller than that probably about four and a half ish because some of those are are not full-time positions so those are the numbers that we've dissected um, and we'll do a better job once we have a little more time in terms of laying this out for you in what you're used to looking at where we compare it um, and then also put together a longer list of what's in and what's out some things that i can tell you um, that are in and out um, one all of our fee increases that we've talked to you about previously are approved in the governor's recommended budget so the food safety fee increase which is a big one and i think it's going to be controversial um, is about a 30 percent fee increase um, our brands program has a fee increase i think that one's going to be another one that could be a tough one um, given where cattle prices are at and there's just a, a, a lot of uncertainty there um, there's a fee increase in our feeds program um, there's a new fee that we're establishing in the pesticide program for a new license type that goes with a legislative concept it really is budget neutral um, and then finally just the ratification of the fees that we adopted in our certification program so that gives you a sense on the other funds fee side the other really good news on the other fund side is there were no fund sweeps and for those of you that have been around you may remember um, in previous sessions where there were fund sweeps and that's really where um, the legislature can use a clause a notwithstanding clause and go in and take other funds and put it into the general fund for general use um, by statute most of the fees that we collect are statutorily appropriated to those programs but this not notwithstanding clause allows those other funds to be moved over into general fund um, we had concern that given where we thought um, the budget might be um, we might see fund sweeps this time around and fortunately there weren't any in the governor's recommended budget um so i think the other thing i would want to mention to you is here some here are a few things that we know are in from kind of the high level look at at the budget um, it looks like the pesticide stewardship program is included in the governor's recommended budget along with the position that goes with it um, that was on our cut list um, so good news for that there's money um, included to continue the monitoring in the Klamath for the Ag Water Quality Program. Um, we are finally seeing limitation for our hemp program and some positions actually established for it. So that's, that's good news. That's an other funded program that's based on the fees that we collect um, for the hemp program. Uh, the worker protection position that we've had in our budget for the last two biennium was included and um, I'm excited because it's made permanent. It's been a limited duration position uh, for, for a couple by any end. So this is good to have this finally made permanent. The other, um, another thing that was included and I was excited to see given all the hard work we did on the lottery fund side this year to protect um, the investments in the Japanese beetle eradication program. Uh, the Japanese beetle eradication program is fully funded at 1.9 million. So that's good news because there is about five years of investment and work into trying to get rid of the Japanese beetle population that we have um, in Multnomah and Washington County. And it would be a shame, frankly, at this point to step away from that with as much as we've put into it um, in work. Federal funds, continuation of, of things like our avian influenza program and um, the FISMA program. 
another exciting add is to our marketing program. And this has been um, a, a long time coming. So most of you, you may remember that the work that we do in the marketing program, all of our ex export work is funded with federal funds through market access funds. The state dollars fund our staff, but we've never had during my tenure really any money to do domestic marketing or domestic marketing work. And um, the governor's budget has included $430,000 for domestic marketing work. And I think that's really to focus on those small to mid-sized companies that want to grow. They may not be ready to move into the export market yet, but they may be ready to move into a larger market. You know, maybe it's Seattle, maybe it's Chicago, maybe it's Boston, but to help move them along um, meet, meeting them where they're at is how I've talked about it. Let's meet these small companies where they're at and help them move and expand to the next step that's appropriate for them for their size and scale and what they want to do. This money will give us an opportunity to do that in the domestic market where we haven't had it before. Um, the governor's budget also um, eliminates our presence at the FIC, you may remember we put forward um, vacating the Food Innovation Center, um, and that is included in this budget. Um, but in part of that, there was a new program established at the recommendation of the Racial, Racial Justice Task Force, and it's a grant program of about a million dollars. Um, we don't have a lot of details yet in terms of what is anticipated to be, you know, the parameters around it, but that was one of the high level um, adds, adds to our budget. So I think I'm gonna pause there because that's the list as I like tried to scroll through everything three times last night and tear apart um, the document that I had um, to get through it. I think, oh, I will add one more thing. I think um, Chair Halleck, we don't know yet, and um, Andrea Boyer is working on it, trying to understand what the cuts to the Ag Water Quality Program are. Um, I'm anticipating that some of the vacancies that we put forward for savings in 2020 probably became permanent cuts, but we haven't teased it apart yet to be able to sort all of that out. So there's more coming, and as soon as we can get those things identified and validated, um, and we're really comfortable with the numbers. We'll put something together that more clearly delineates everything that's in the GRB. Thank you um, very much, Lisa. And um, yeah, I want to see if the board has any questions. I'm going to start with a question on the on the program priority list that was provided to the board. The document that you have to read with the magnifying glass. That one. Um, anyway. Um, what is in the governor's recommended budget, there's almost an $11 million other fund for the meat inspection program. It's your top priority. So is that an action that has yet to be taken by the legislature? So it's not in the governor's rec or what is, what's the deal with that? Uh, turn on your mic, Lisa. Sorry. I, when I put the paper up to look at what you were talking about, it shut it off. Um, so on the prioritized list, food safety is ranked as our number one priority. Um, during, I don't, I'm not remembering which special session it was, but using some of, was it the first? Okay, thanks, Alexis. The first special session, uh, the legislator, legislature provided money to create a state meat inspection program. Um, we have that money now, Lauren and the food safety staff um, and Carla are working with several different stakeholder groups to begin to develop what that program is going to look like. Um, I don't think we've added the meat program into this priority list yet in terms of updating it. So it will go in, in how we rank it, I think that's probably something that we all need to talk about. Typically, we've had new programs farther down the list, um, more towards the bottom. Um, 
there may be different feelings about that given the priorities that are out there today. And so I think that's part of the reason we wanted to start the conversation about the priority list with the board. Um, two, to familiarize our new members with it because this has been the source of how we've made a lot of decisions over time um, when we've been in tough budget situations for the agency. And then just to have some discussion, and I think it probably is a longer term discussion than what we have time for today, um, around how we think about these programs and their ranking. So I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna speak to it high level. This is a hard one when you can't have all the documents in front of you. And if you're trying to look at it on your screen, it's almost impossible to look on the screen. But just to give you the general emphasis. So we have the prioritized program list. It's been in place for quite some time. Um, we've tried to look at it in terms of those programs that affect public health being very high priorities. Um, those programs that are statutorily required, high priorities. Um, and then how we uh, impact the market and help support the agricultural economy was it's kind of like the third pillar so we really tried to base it on our mission um, as we've had new programs come in we've typically used kind of a last in first out philosophy when we have had to work through um, budget reductions so it should be as, as we look at it, it's probably no surprise that the food safety program in general is our number one priority because it affects all Oregonians every day. And it's also really the basis when you think about um, a pillar in terms of supporting the agricultural economy and food processing um, in our domestic and international markets, uh, having that reputation for safe food. You'll also notice it has a pretty big chunk of general fund and some of those general funded programs, they really are in that top page and a half. And then we're out of general fund in this agency and we move into those other funding sources like lottery funds, a lot of other funds. Um, generally, people think of us as another funded agency for the most part um, because we have so many programs that are fee for service. Um, I think the, the, the second one on there is our regulatory lab. It ties right into our food safety program and the core of the work that we do here in the agency. Um, and then we move into some of our um, natural resource programs that protect the environment, protect water quality. Um, our ag marketing program is in there. It has a pretty big chunk of general fund um, and how it generally supports um, the basis of the agricultural economy in the state. Um, yep, it's like on, on to page two, when you get to about program number 10, we move pretty quickly into other fund um, and lottery funded programs. There's a couple of them that have some general fund, but not necessarily a lot. And then we natural resource programs tend to be kind of that next tier of programs. Um, followed by moving into the other funded programs that continue to support um, natural resources, et cetera. So our feeds program, um, fertilizer, nursery, Christmas tree, shipping point inspection, those are all um, very major key components um, in our other funded programs here in the agency. And I think I'm gonna stop there unless you want me to talk about the ones at the end, but th hopefully that gives you a sense in terms of putting that public health and safety first, protecting natural resources, and then supporting the economy kind of in the priorities. Um, and we can surely go through this list in more detail with all of you or some of you at some later date if you'd like me to do that. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I have one question and then we'll see if the board does. On, on your number, uh, your fourth priority, I think, that was also, which is plant protection and conservation, that was also listed as a reduction option, which seems kind of inconsistent for it to be a top priority. And did what did, did the governor did the governor do anything about that? I can't remember what you said. Right. So um, 
IPPM, Insect Pest Prevention Management, that's where the Japanese beetle program would be housed. So like I, I think I mentioned, I was excited to see that investment continued into the next biennium. Um, we took, made significant changes um, in this program for 2020. And that was because of the uncertainty in lottery funds when bars and restaurants closed and we didn't know what it would look like in terms of lottery fund revenues. Um, lottery fund revenues are a little different um, in terms of state dollars. They're, I think of them more like other funds or your checkbook. You can only spend what you have in cash. And we didn't know what cash we would be, be getting because we get quarterly allotments of lottery funds. And so not knowing how people were going to be able to play, what would happen in terms of the lottery funds uh, falling off, that was a concern for us. Um, so it's still a high priority, but we did things in a different way. And once we're able to really dissect the rest of the governor's budget, Stephanie, this is one of those areas, other than recognizing that um, the Japanese beetle eradication program was included, we haven't dissected down to see what else was left there. Okay. Chair Halleck, if I could just add, I think one of the things, and Lisa kind of alluded to this, about 20% of our budget comes from general fund, about 7 to 10% comes from lottery funds. So when we have to put together per, um, options for the governor or the legislature to consider for cuts, we enter, we, it, it doesn't take a lot to hit our core programs because we just don't get a lot of funding from those sources. About almost 60% of our agency's budget comes from those other funds. So just in context, it's hard when we have to come up with a 10% cut list, 15% um, cut list to not hit some of what programs that we would say are core important programs in those funding buckets. Okay, thank you. Um, any other board members have questions for uh, Deputy Director Hansen before we move to the next agenda item? Um, I guess a, a question I have, uh, Chairman Halleck and, and, and Lisa, back to that meat inspection, when will be the time to be able to talk about, is that still necessary? And I don't know what chunk of money we're talking about as part, part as part of the food safety uh, high priority. So I, I don't know what the appropriate time would be, or is it something we should weigh in on? So thank you, um, Elin. The, the meat inspection program is continued in the governor's recommended budget is my understanding. Isn't it, are we not sure yet? I'm looking at Alexis's face. So Maybe we need to like double check that one to be, be sure. And I may be so, presuming because so, I couldn't detail down that far. I thought it was not. So here's the thing, like there's a, okay. like there, we still have a lot to dig into and I don't know if Lauren's on, but I think let us bring that back to the board. Um, I actually was thinking as, as um, Lisa and Chair Halleck were talking about this, that maybe in January we would should um, on the board agenda bring an update on the meat inspection um, program because we have one piece is the regulatory framework, but there are many other pieces to actually making this successful. And that's why we have organized about 100 stakeholders into kind of three different buckets. One is regulatory, one is market, one is the food processing needs um, on kind of the infrastructure investment that they may need to make. And so there's many pieces to this for success, I think. And I think we could have, be in a good spot in January to bring that to the board where we are and, and, and kind of the path forward in those various um, um, buckets that we've divided this program into with our stakeholders to make sure that it is going to be successful if we do. So. Thanks for your help with okay. that, Alexis. Uh, is that good for you, Elon Miller? Is that? Yeah, that, that would be perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, any other questions for yes. Lisa or Barbara, or, yeah. Barbara Boyer has a question. Go ahead, Barbara. So, Lisa, you had mentioned I didn't quite um, wasn't clear about what's happening at the FIC or everybody's vacating. Is that what I understood? Um, 
So we are moving our marketing program out of the Food Innovation Center. I think 2020 has taught us that they can do their work in a different way, working remotely. And um, it was a pretty big savings for the agency. And as we focused our um, reductions and had priorities about how we were going to do reductions to this agency, we focused on maintaining core staff and core programs. And so vacating um, that site at the FIC with, with the knowledge that we can do our work in a different way um, was one of the choices. The laboratory is going to remain at the FIC for now because there's ongoing discussions. The state has bought a facility in Wilsonville um, the Mid Valley Complex, and they're looking to put many of the state's laboratory functions into this single complex. And so we are one of the laboratories that's proposed to move to the Mid Valley Complex when that all comes to fruition. Um, this is one of the projects Alexis alluded to all that Jason Barber does. Uh, Jason has been working on this with the architects etc and looking at um, blueprints and what that might look like as we talk about moving our laboratory functions and in this case it's not only the regulatory laboratory that's at the FIC it's also some of the laboratories that we have in our Salem office building as well that um, we would look to move into that single complex so it's a staged process Barbara all right, thank you. Okay, we're Agreed. running a bit behind, but yeah, any more? Yes, yeah, Dean Sams. Yeah, Alan Sams from OSU. I just wanted to, for everybody's uh, edification, that when ODA is moving out of FIC, that doesn't mean FIC is closing. Um, ODA is a, ha, has a marketing group and a lab group there that are in a tenant lease uh, arrangement with us, and so um, the rest of FIC, the research and 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 uh, product development work that goes on to help uh, entrepreneurs in the region, um, that's still gonna all continue. So OSU's presence there is gonna continue, it's just ODA as a tenant is moving out and, and we're in the process of trying to replace that, uh, that, uh, that, that tenant for that space. Just wanna make sure that everybody knows that OSU's still gonna be there. Thank you, Dean Sands. So I think in the interest of time, we're gonna move on to Stephanie Page in the uh, update on the memorandum of, of understanding between DEQ and ODA on CAFOs. And Steph, if you're able to do it in minutes, that would be swell. Absolutely. Um, good morning, Chair Halleck and board members. Stephanie Page with Oregon Department of Agriculture. I'd also like to note that I've got um, Justin Green, the Water Quality Division Administrator with DEQ, joining us this morning. So welcome, Justin. And then Wim Matthews, our CAFO and Fertilizer Program Manager, is also on to help answer questions that might come up. So morning to both of you, and thanks for being here. So this is an update related to the Confined Animal Feeding Operations Program. Um, and we call that CAFO for short. CAFOs are generally defined as the confined or concentrated feeding or holding of animals in building pens or lots where the surface is prepared to support animals in wet weather and where or where there are wastewater treatment facilities such as manure lagoons. So this could include very small facilities all the way from a very small dog kennel or a small goat dairy all the way up to a, a significantly large feedlot or, or dairy operation and, and several other types of operations as well. Um, Oregon Department of Agriculture and DEQ staff have been working over about the past year to update a memorandum of understanding between our agencies and this it replaces a previous MOU that is set to expire at the end of 2020. Uh, the MOU was first authorized by legislation in 1993. The legislature authorized ODA to perform any function of the Environmental Quality Commission or DEQ consistent with this memorandum of understanding. So Department of Environmental Quality is delegated authority from the EPA to administer the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Program in Oregon and so the, and the purpose of the MOU is to convey authority to ODA to administer the program for CAFOs. 
and it is renewed every five years. So in terms of ODA's responsibilities in the MOU, we do the day-to-day -day program operations. So that includes on the ground compliance work, routine inspections, complaint investigations, technical assistance to both permitted and non-permitted CAFOs, as well as permit development, um, the permit issuance, both general and individual permits, animal waste management plan review and approval and construction plan review and approval, and then the enforcement. We are the lead on enforcement as well. And we have all of the same enforcement authorities available to us that DEQ has. Um, DEQ's responsibilities include the, providing technical support to ODA. We periodically reach out to DEQ and, and request that. Uh, developing and updating administrative rules, and those rules are generally applied to a variety of permitted facilities, but we use some of the provisions of DEQ's rules as they apply to CAFOs, um, and DEQ has that delegated authority, as I mentioned earlier, from EPA for National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Program, um, and our agencies work together in developing and issuing those water quality permits, both general and individual. So over the past year, um, our staff have been working together to update the MOU with, with some relatively minor updates, I would say. That draft updated MOU, which would have an, another five-year lifespan, was presented to the Environmental Quality Commission in July. Um, and the, the original plan was for that to be um, considered for approval at the November EQC meeting. Um, there was some additional feedback provided at the July EQC meeting, um, and it made us realize we, we should go back and consider some additional edits to the MOU to reflect the way the program currently does business and reflect some changes also that we've been discussing to the general permit, um, the general NPDES permit. So some of those additional items to reflect the, the direction of the program and the way that we're that we would like to do business include um, adding a, a provision for a two-step permitting process for certain new facilities, um, incorporating the policy decision to require individual permits for certain uh, facilities that land apply manure in groundwater management areas. So that's again something the the program already does um, that could be captured in an updated MOU. And then incorporating our agency's plans to work closely together on agronomics of wastewater application, whether we're talking about facilities permitted by DEQ or facilities permitted jointly by the agencies. So to allow us to go back and do some additional work um, on the MOU, DEQ is going to be taking a short-term extension of the existing MOU to the EQC with an expiration date of July 2021. So I'm going to stop there and ask Justin to add any points that he would like to make, and then we'll turn it over um, for questions. Chair Halleck, members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and to um, it's great to to meet you all. Um, I don't want to add too much. I think Stephanie provided a great summary. Um, and I know that we're we're focusing on time, but um, you know I, I'm very appreciative of the strong relationship that we have with ODA between ODA and DEQ. Um, I look forward to working with Stephanie and Wim on on updating the the MOU um, to to you know, document the work and the partnership that that the two the two agencies have, um, and to really you know have that transparency and show that the work that we that we do together. Um, and just once again, thank you for for having me here today. Okay, um, Steph, um, just briefly, so you have three areas that you're focusing on, and I think we're looking at, you're updating the board that there's going to be an extension till June to work on this together. The two-step permitting, could you just say a, a little bit about what kind of facilities that would apply to, and those three points you made, the two-step permitting, the land application permits, and the agronomic rates, just maybe a few mm -hmm. more details. Thanks. Sure, absolutely. And and I would say those are, I think, are some of the main things. That's not necessarily an exhaustive list, but I think those are, are some of the most significant things. So the two-step permitting is basically, that would be an initial approval for construction for new facilities. 
And then a second approval to populate and operate the facility after ODA has a chance to verify that the facility's been built according to the plans that were submitted to us and that the, all of the wastewater handling facilities function as designed. So that our thought is that, and Wim can help me here, I think we had thought that would apply to new um, tier two large facilities. So that reflects the same um, size criteria that some legislation proposed um, in a couple of recent legislation, legislative sessions would have, um, would have required that two-step process for. Okay, Wim, did you want to add anything to that? Or is that, are we good? Well, thanks, Chair Halleck and board members. Yeah, I think we're good. Uh, the the two-step would be for a defined group of, of facilities that are brand new. So these are brand new mm -hmm. facilities from the ground up. With these would not be existing facilities is the only clarification I'd add there. Great. Would that apply to Easter Day? Yes, it would apply to that facility. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know, that's one of the large capitals in uh, the Boardman area. Um, and what? Just one other question to refresh me: Who sets the agronomic rates, ODA or DEQ, or do you do it cooperatively? So I can take that, Chair Halleck. The uh, so agronomic agronomic rate is a calculation that is required in land application permits that both ODA and DQ issue, and so it's a the 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 rate is an algorithm, and then you plug in test result values and other pieces of information into that algorithm to get an answer, and so I would say that neither of the agencies necessarily set that that rate because the rate is unique to each facility and each material but the agencies do set you know set the requirement for the algorithm and set the parameters of the algorithm so that everybody has to use the same calculational activity to to arrive at that answer but i do want to stress that the answers are going to be different for everybody depending on what material they're dealing with what crop they're growing uh, at their site, what weather conditions are at their site, what kind of soil types they have, and, and other, you know, a whole host of other agronomic considerations that need to be taken into account there. Okay, thank you, Wim. So other board members, we have a couple more minutes. Any more questions for Stephanie or Wim or uh, the water director from DEQ? Welcome to our meeting, by the way. I should have done that before. Nice to meet you. I've heard your name before. Thank you. Okay. Um, Stephanie, thank you and your team. And um, I think we will move on to welcome our guest from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I do want to remind everyone that public comment is scheduled for 10 a.m. Uh, we have a number of people. I think we're uh, one person dropped off. We have nine people. Um, everybody gets three minutes. And so um, we want to allow time for everyone to speak. Uh, Derek uh, Broman is joining from ODFW. And before we get into this presentation on the Cougar Management Plan, I want to give everybody, particularly our new members, some background um, on this issue. So I welcome you and thank you for being here, Derek. Um, we are reviewing Resolution 275, which supports ODFW's Cougar Management Plan later on in board business. We'll be looking at that resolution. And we're going to hear the nine people who are signed up to testify today of public comment are, are talking on that issue. We also received, um, the board, entire board received hundreds of comments on the issue of the Cougar Management Plan, written comments. Um, I wanna explain to the people who are um, new to the board and anybody listening in why we have requested this briefing from ODFW today. And the first thing that I wanna make clear is that the Oregon Department, neither the Oregon Department of Agriculture or the Board of Agriculture <clears throat> has any regulatory authority whatsoever over cougar management in the state of Oregon. That authority is vested in the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. 
And the board's resolution, um, and I had, had the privilege of explaining to the new board members earlier what board resolutions are all about. Um, they are simply um, policy statements uh, made by the Board of Agriculture. They do not have regulatory weight. Um, and in this case, this resolution was adopted to support the Cougar Management Plan of our sister agency. Um, again, as we all know, our role um, as a board is to be an advocate for agriculture in Oregon, and we have an interest in any issue that potentially affects farming or ranching operations in the state. Um, the second point that I want to make about this is um, the history of re the actual um, dates, et cetera, of the history of Resolution 275. It's been in place for 14 years since 2006 in response to ODFW's proposed Cougar Management Plan at that time. Um, and a member of the board at that time and some of the staff working on the issue at ODA asked the board to consider supporting ODSW's plan. And the board in 2006 adopted a very brief resolution. And it's so brief that I'm gonna to read to you what it said. Whereas the Oregon State Board of Agriculture recognizes the threat and overpopulation of cougars poses to the livestock industry in Oregon, be it resolved that the Board of Agriculture supports the Cougar Management Plan as proposed by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. That was pretty much the extent of the resolution in 2006, and no one commented on the adoption of the resolution at that time. Then in 2017, uh, ODFW updated their Cougar Management Plan, um, and the Board of Agriculture, a, a work group of this board, determined that we ought to look at Resolution 275 to see whether it was still relevant, needed to be updated, or could be archived. And that work group review of the resolution was part of a new procedure that the board had put in place to ensure that all resolutions are reviewed, updated, or archived on a regular basis. No board member or member of the public or anyone from ODFW asked the board to take any action on the resolution in 2017. So the board work group revised and updated the resolution and brought it to the full board for consideration at the September 23rd 2020 board meeting. At that meeting, that was our last meeting, the board did not take any action on the resolution, but requested a briefing from ODFW on what had changed in Cougar management since the 2006 resolution was adopted before making a decision whether to update or archive the resolution. And that's the reason ODFW is briefing the board today. It was at the board's request. And of course, board materials are always made available to the public and much interest has been expressed in the board's discussion of the resolution as you will hear today. And then the final point I wanna make is that the resolution, the original 2006 version of resolu resolution 275 that includes the brief text that I read to you earlier plus one language update that refers to the 2017 uh, uh, ODFW Cougar Management Plan um, is the resolution that is currently on the books. And it will stand on the books unless the board takes at explicit action to archive it or modify it. So the version that you see in the board's packet um, and that the public has been commenting on is only a work group recommendation. And that included, I think, paragraphs of uh, three paragraphs of background material, et cetera. Um, and the work group met again uh, yesterday evening, um, and they have no uh, further changes or um, uh, no further changes to the to the resolution. And they would still recommend that the board adopt uh, the revised language uh, after they hear uh, comment from the public today. So that's the history on this resolution. And um, are there any questions on the history before um, Derek takes over to talk about it? Okay, thank you very much. Derek, welcome. Thank you, Chair Halleck. Uh, <clears throat> members of the board for the record, Derek Broman, I am the carnivore fur bear coordinator for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. 
Um, I manage the bear, cougar, wolf, and fur bearer programs for the agency. Um, so I've got a hopefully brief presentation. Um, Stephanie, if you want to pull it up, I think most of the animations make sense. I did realize one was a bit of a goof, so I'll have to have you thumb through some stuff pretty quickly. But um, ideally, I'll, I'll provide just a brief overview. Uh, so and then Carla, excuse me, just one minute. Carla, are you with us? I think you are the one who needs to pull this up. There we go. Thank you, because I have no technical skills. There we go. Um, so yeah, I, I'll try to be brief. This is a, a really meaty topic, uh, one that I get really excited about and uh, has an enormous history in the state of Oregon. So we could talk literally for hours. So um, feel free to raise a hand if I need to get back on track. Um, so next slide, please. So to provide a little bit of a background uh, on our plan, I feel it's necessary for folks to understand really where we are talking about where cougars reside. This is a map showing cougar mortalities dating back to 1987. And you can see that while there are dots pretty much all, everywhere around the state, the vast majority of those dots are located in Northeastern Oregon and Southwestern Oregon. Next slide, please. And using those dots, we've been able to construct some habitat models and habitat maps. The green areas being areas identified as cougar habitat, the red being not as good cougar habitat. Um, and obviously you can see that there's like a tight association with forested areas, um, but even the high desert, we see a lot of areas where there's adequate cougar habitat, especially as you look at the steens, which jump out on the map there as the bright green uh, stretch heading northeast, southwest. Um, but pretty much all of Western Oregon uh, is very suitable for cougars. Um, and what's something that we have to oftentimes remind ourselves are uh, sometimes cougar habitat in Oregon that we deem um, being less suitable is oftentimes the best cougar habitat in a lot of places of the Intermountain West. So we are really uh, an area that has prime, prime cougar habitat and pretty robust cougar populations. Next slide, please. Uh, also for background, <clears throat> just want to point out a, a number of statutes that are uh, specific to cougars and cougar management. Uh, in 1967, cougars were, were declared a game mammal, which um, that's pretty impressive too, that that animal uh, has had that status for that long. Uh, and again, ODFW has management authority. Our wildlife policy directs our agency on how to manage wildlife. One really important statute, the, the wildlife damage statute, uh, allows landowners <clears throat> to take bears or cougars that are causing damage or are a nuisance without a permit. And so that statute supersedes Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's authority. However, all of those animals that are taken must be checked into ODFW. Uh, the hunting with dogs is prohibited for bears and cougars and bait is prohibited specifically for bears. That's again, also in statute um, and any person may take a bear or cougar that poses a human safety threat. Um, so these are some very important statutes uh, that dictate what ODFW does. And again, supersedes all state agencies. Um, and it's something that we have to remind folks, this isn't very common across a lot of other states. Next slide, please. So uh, you just heard from, uh, Chair Halleck, that we updated our Cougar plan in 2017. Our very first plan was in 1987, which again is quite impressive because there's a lot of states that um, don't have plans in place for cougars, don't even classify them as game mammals. Um, so we've had a first plan since 1987. We've had numerous updates. The 2016 update was quite enormous. Um, and in 2017, we updated the, the plan. That was the process or uh, the product of about a two year process. We had, I think, five commission meetings spanning across the state. I think we had one in Bandon, uh, one in LeGrand, one in Salem, and I think we adopted it in Prineville. So all over the state, we had a number of uh, invited panels of stakeholders uh, to provide testimony. Um, and really this plan update was great because it now is a, a, a very contemporary piece of information that is rich with Oregon specific information. Um, that's one of the, the largest 
changes from the 20, 2006 plan was there's a whole nother decade of Oregon research that had occurred and Oregon data collection that we were able to plug into that plan. So in many cases, our plan is based on Oregon-based information. We don't have to lean on the general literature and trying to you know, compare things apples to oranges across that animal's range in North America. Um, so it's a, a great plan, a lot of documentation in there, uh, very contemporary, still very contemporary, even three years later. But I'll try to stay on point to the, the items that might be most of interest to uh, the ODA board. Next slide, please. So um, the plan dictates and directs us to manage cougars and to collect data and to work at all sorts of various spatial scales, anything from the statewide level down to county or lower. But in many cases, we manage cougars according to the six cougar zones across the state that you can see here on this map. I'll be making a number of references to these zones, primarily zone A, but just wanted to hopefully get that burned into your minds just a little bit so you understand that how we kind of split up the state because this is an animal that has very large home ranges and so this is a fairly appropriate scale for managing this species uh, and is a little bit different than how we manage a number of other species. Next slide please. Uh, Carl, you're welcome to, to scroll through to get all the content on this page. This is an obnoxious thing I didn't remove, I apologize. Um, so the Cougar Management Plan has four objectives. The first objective is that we do not have populations fall below 3,000 cougars across all age classes. Um, that is the primary objective that must be met before we can address objectives two through four. That number of 3,000 was the estimate of the cougar population in 1994 when ballot measure 18 was passed. Um, so this 3,000 number isn't necessarily a target so much as it is just a uh, really, really conservative safety net for cougar populations in the state. Um, objective two is specific to addressing cougar human safety concerns. Objective three is specific to cougar livestock conflict. And objective four is specific to managing cougar populations in concert with other game mammals. Now I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about objective one, and then I'll get into some details of objective twos and three, but I likely will not be talking much at all about objective four here today. Next slide, please. So we have a population model for the state of Oregon. Uh, it's a peer reviewed model published in the scientific journal. Um, this model is updated by using information from cougar mortalities, all cougar mortalities. <clears throat> We plug that information into the model uh, and we've conducted research in Oregon for many, many decades and that research also contributes to the population model. And so the 2019 statewide population estimate for cougars is about 6,600 cougars across all age classes. Um, without providing exact numbers, usually that estimate consists of about half of adults. Um, and we get a lot of questions of why do we present numbers across all age classes? And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, one, we put in mortality information into that model for all age classes. We don't ignore mortalities of juveniles. Uh, the model spits out estimates that include animals of all age classes. So we're really being transparent and presenting all this information because two, all of these animals matter. Uh, we, we count all mortalities regardless of the age or sex. Uh, we have models that present those types of numbers. So that's why we present uh, the numbers of all age classes. Next slide, please. So we actually have the Cougar model for each one of our zones. And so each of those models can be adjusted based on the conditions uh, in each of those zones. Um, so that number of 6,600 is the sum across all six of our zones. Um, and one interesting thing you'll see here is that the vast majority of our cougar zones have cougar population estimates that are likely at or near capacity. You'll see that that's the case for zones B through F. Zone A is the only zone where we're not almost at that ceiling. The model actually suggests that zone C is slightly above uh, the capacity. So when we talk about trends of cougar populations, 
really we're talking about population stability because it's essentially at capacity for the vast majority of the state, but population growth specifically in Western Oregon and Zone A, which includes the coast, the North Cascades. But an important take home is that we are again still so far above that uh, objective of having 3,000 cougars across all age classes. Next slide. Eric, if, if I may, um, what does at capacity mean? Um, so the, the model is based on uh, the concept of carrying capacity, which is essentially the number of animals that the habitat and all the resources associated with it can support. So if we've got a density estimate and we've got a certain amount of habitat, we can estimate how many cougars zone A can support. And that's really what the model is looking at is where is that population relative to that maximum level. And so um, once they start to reach that level, there are certain density dependent factors that kick in. Some of the populations become self-regulating, but it's usually through some pretty nasty uh, ecological responses such as disease. Uh, we actually likely documented a density dependent response from research in Southwest Oregon, where we had cougar populations that were at record high densities and then uh, an intestinal worm came in and wiped out uh, a lot of cougars, which is kind of that response of cougars being above capacity and, and pretty nasty death, but it was fascinating that we were able to observe that occurrence. Thank you for that answer. And, and can one assume from that uh, in, in those areas that livestock might be more at risk if there are, are not natural ways for the cougars to get food, et cetera? Yeah, so if we are nearing capacity, um, that means that cougars are always, you know, seeking out the most ideal, most uh, suitable of habitats. Those that have the greatest amount of pay, prey uh, and uh, others of the opposite sex for breeding purposes. Um, and so once those are occupied, because these are territorial species, they then have to venture out, typically the juveniles seeking out their own new home range, um, will seek out the primary habitats, but if those are occupied, they sometimes have to settle for less suitable. And that is likely why we are seeing a lot of encroachment of cougars into our urban areas because the rural areas are at capacity. And in some cases, um, in those more developed or less suitable habitats, cougars can, can make a good living um, and don't get into conflict. But yes, that just does increase the odds of an encounter simply because you're having more cougars where a lot of people reside. Thank you. Um, so one of the ways that um, we ensure that we don't fall below that 3000 are the implementation of zone quotas. And really this is a, a misnomer. It's really a, a mortality cap that according to the model, each one of our zones, we don't want to exceed a certain number of total mortalities. Otherwise, if that's exceeded for repeated years, we could see that population fall below that 3,000. And I did a poor job of selecting my colors, but you can see that over the last 10 years, there's only been four instances where this mortality cap was exceeded, and that was in zone A, uh, most recently in 2018. So these mortalities are across all sources. Uh, hunting, cougars taken for human safety, road kills, cougars killed by other cougars, uh, again, across all cl age classes as well. So those all go towards the count. Um, this count starts at on January 1st. And if that number is met, hunting for the durate rest of the year for that zone is closed. However, cougars can still be taken for livestock damage, for human safety, uh, and we still keep counting those and we keep counting any other mortalities. So in 2018, we met that 180, hunting was closed for the rest of the year. And I think it occurred, I think uh, late November, but yet we had 13 more cougars taken or uh, show up dead um, somehow. So, uh, but you can see that the zone quotas across the state allow for 970 cougar mortalities. Yet on an annual basis, we're only about 500. So we are so far from really having any uh, impact to the population or, or threat to not satisfying that first objective. Um, looking across all of these mortalities, 
um, it's about six to eight percent of the cougar population. When it comes to adults, it's about four to five percent of the adult mortality. Uh, and that is so far from the published literature showing that you need to have mortality levels of 25 to about 40 percent before you see population decline. So uh, our populations are extremely robust and really only trajecting upwards. Next slide, please. Derek, I would just uh, remind you, you have about 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Another way that we monitor populations are looking at certain indices. We look at the proportion of adult females across all mortality sources because they are the breeding component of the, the breeding and, and caring for the young uh, in the population. And across all of our zones, we're not into those any areas of concern. Um, so really, no matter how you look at it, we are not in any danger of having populations in decline or uh, in any sort of uh, downward trajectory. Next slide, please. So this is an awfully messy table, but this is where I'm gonna talk now about objectives two and three regarding safety and damage. Um, ODFW maintains a wildlife damage database where we record complaints. Um, these complaints don't include sightings. We actually tag those as something different in our damage database. Um, but I wanna point out that uh, complaints can be very subjective. Oftentimes they're driven by uh, news events or current events. And so the agency actually leans much more on animals taken for damage and taken for human safety as a barometer of what's going on in the state. Complaints though are a good sense of temperature, but sometimes they're just far too subjective and biased. Um, so we can't always necessarily lean on those, uh, much more lean on the, the mortalities. Um, looking at that table, Thank you. The uh, greatest source of mortality for cougars in the state are hunter harvest, followed by cougars taken on damage, and then safety. Um, and so we really can't draw a direct comparison between the complaints and animals taken for damage or human safety. Uh, the vast majority of the time, ODFW gets a complaint that does not lead to a cougar being taken. Uh, again, there's statute allowing the public to take action themselves, and that's the majority of the time. ODFW is not involved in the taking of cougars on damage or for human safety. So we really can't <clears throat> draw any connection between complaints and cougars that are taken on damage and safety. Um, and so uh, next slide, please. Regarding trends on this information, um, across the state, pooling this information, hunter harvest is pretty stable, pretty consistent. Cougars taken on damage and safety is relatively stable. Populations have gone up. And complaints outside of just the last two years here have been a bit on a decline. Now, this is at the statewide scale, um, but really we look things at, again, the zone level, and it's more important to look at what's going on a more local level. Next slide, please. And so zone A is where we are spending a lot of our attention, and that's where this topic is the hottest. Uh, cougar populations, both in number and distribution, have been increasing across zone A for many decades now. Um, the map on the far right, if I were to update that, there'd be a lot more little black dots throughout the North Coast, especially. So this is obviously where most Oregonians reside. And so you're having cougars show up, arguably for the first time in their generation. And there's just a lot of uncertainty and not sure what to do and how to respond. Um, so this is where a lot of the attention is, is focused for ODFW. Next slide, please. And if you look at those uh, complaints and mortalities, if you just pull out zone A, you can see that those complaints have been ramping up over the last decade or so versus the rest of the state were stagnant or on the decline because the rest of the state have been dealing with cougars and coexisting with cougars now for many decades. They know what the statutes are. They know how to address issues and resolve conflict. So zone A is really where we spend a lot of our time and that's where we try to focus our communication with the public. Next slide, please. And so we have a bunch of materials on our website. Fortunately, uh, a lot of uh, journalists are aware of that as well. So it's kind of nice that Oregon is so far progressed that uh, when there is a cougar story that pops up, ODFW oftentimes doesn't get a phone call from reporters. They know where the resources are and they provide those in their stories and their online reports, which is really positive. Uh, one of the unique situations that we see in zone A are the increasing rates of hobby farms uh, and hobby livestock, ranchettes, 
where you've got, say, uh, hobby livestock, you've got free ranging livestock that's become a little bit of a problem for us. Not just limited to cougars, uh, it's bears and raptors and everything out there that wants to take advantage of, of some of those animals. And it's a little bit difficult because those, those entities are so numerous, but not necessarily well connected relative to more traditional livestock practices. So this is a bit of a, a new area ODFW and stakeholders are interested in venturing into to try and see if we can't get ahead of some of these potential issues to try to change some, some techniques and practices to alleviate conflict. Uh, next slide, please. So happy to address any questions that the board may have. Um, I'll try to be succinct, uh, but as you can tell, there's a lot of information here, so uh, we can go in many different directions. Thank you, Derek. Um, before the board jumps in, I have one question. How does, how does uh, the other Western states or other states that have large cougar populations, what do they do briefly um, compared to what we're doing in Oregon? Do they have cougar management plans? How, how, what can you tell us, particularly in the West? So across most of the West, the use of hounds is legal as a hunting tool. And so in those states, they prefer to use hound hunting, which is a far more efficient practice uh, of harvesting cougars as their tool for reducing cougar numbers to alleviate conflict. In states like California, uh, Oregon, and Washington, hound hunting is prohibited. Uh, in Washington, they issue permits so that the state has to issue those permits. In Oregon, we don't have to issue permits because statute allows the public to take that action. California, cougars are listed as a have a special designation where there's no hunting uh, and so the state has to issue permits but it's a, a little bit more rigorous process so it doesn't happen as frequently thank you um questions from other board members barbara boyer i have a quick question um in respect with our time and public comment coming up um, Derek, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very educational for me. Um, you, your first map of zones, there were two areas that were completely blacked out. What, what were those? Uh, one of the areas was the Warm Springs Reservation and the other area was uh, Crater Lake National Park. Um, as ODFW does not have authority in those areas, they are exempt from uh, our zone delineation. Excellent, that's what I thought, thank you. And board members, I don't wanna to be too rigid about this. Please feel like you can ask questions if you have questions. If we go a little bit over, it's okay. Anyone else? Uh, Joe Halleck, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can, this must be Tyson Raymond. Yeah, Tyson Raymond. Um, Derek, we received a, a lot of public comment and <clears throat> there there were some uh, <clears throat> quite a few things that kept the kind of recurring themes and one of those themes was that the cougar management plan doesn't subscribe to the best available science and in fact by removing a cougar you're actually increasing <clears throat> depredation of animals the livestock um, you name it. So my question is, 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 do you believe that to be true? <clears throat> and I'm assuming you're, you're, you're basing um, some of this on, on the Hiller et al. article, but who's wrong? <laughs> do ranchers just want to kill these animals so much they're willing to sacrifice more of their own animals in order to do it? Or are some people perhaps misreading the latest available science? Thank you for the question. Um, so that question comes up a lot. It came up a lot in the plan update. It's come up in legislative hearings. Um, our plan is a comprehensive uh, overview of all of the, the science out there. So the science that you're likely seeing pointed to is in the Cougar plan. And we address this question head on. Um, even explain why one study came up with the conclusion that they did. But again, there is a study, a rigorous study published in a legitimate rigorous wildlife publication using Oregon data that saw that there was not a, a 
positive relationship between harvest and damage. Uh, so, or actually, well, I mean, that we that that study showed that the harvest decreased damage. So, I think it's sometimes um, perhaps a narrow view, not incorporating the Hiller at all, or simply the Oregon information that we have in the areas where we have the highest mortalities, in the areas where we have oftentimes the highest number of damage. We don't see that response. If that were true, the areas where we have the highest cougar mortalities should be just buried in conflict, and that is not the case at all. So it's really, there's the, the, the real range of published literature that has, says something, and then there's the Oregon data that also says something. So it's really, we put it to bed numerous times, but it's, um, it's, a, it's an approach that um, seems to oftentimes be a little bit narrow, but we do indeed try to find long-term solutions. And sometimes lethal is not the long-term solution. Uh, it might just be a, a short fix or it might not be an appropriate tool. So that's where we go into the advice every time we talk to the public about, you know, maybe this technique or this husbandry technique maybe could be implemented to alleviate some of that conflict moving forward. Tyson, questions from the board? All right, thank you, Derek, very much for your time. Uh, uh, we're moving to public comment in here in just a moment. I would say to the board members, in the interest of time, um, I would suggest that we take self breaks as best so that we can keep moving on. Um, we have nine people uh, signed up to speak on this issue and Carla I presume I can just call the name director Taylor is nodding so hearing no objection I will call the name and and wait uh, I hope a sufficient amount of time for the person to come on so um, we will start with Michelle Blake uh, who is the Western Region one coordinator of the Mountain Lion Foundation and each commenter has three minutes, and I'm asking uh, Carla to keep time, please. So, Michelle, welcome, and um, please provide your comments. Yes, thank you, Chair Halleck, members of the board. I suppose for the record, again, I should just state that my name is Michelle Blake. I'm the Western Region One Blake. Coordinator for the Mountain Lion Foundation. Uh, and I've lived in Oregon for more than 30 years. Uh, we urge you to reject this resolution. We know many people continue to believe that hunting is a useful management tool at preventing conflicts, but this belief persists in spite of repeated scientific research that clearly proves it's not effective. And in fact, hunting cougars is shown to increase livestock depredations. Uh, Derek just mentioned Hiller et al. And that study is the outlier. The larger body of science bears this out. Most of the science is produced right here in the Northwest, uh, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia. Um, one of the pivotal studies is a 2013 peer reviewed study out of the University of Washington and the WDFW. And that research team studied each game management unit within Washington state, concluding that the areas with the most intensive hunting saw an immediate spike the next year in depredations and complaints. And that increase was anywhere from 36% to 240%. <laughs> Um, ODFW's Cougar Management Plan is an aggressive one. All researchers do acknowledge the difficulty in obtaining exact population estimates for large carnivores, but ODFW is different in their policy of including kittens in the population es es estimate, and that's controversial for good reason. Kittens have a high mortality rate, so including them in the estimate just brings an already inflated estimate into the realm of the impossible. Oregon's high hunting quota of 970 cougars amounts to 28% of the adult and sub-adult population, which is double the widely accepted conservation standard of 12 to 14%. So endorsing this plan would endorse an unsustainable level of hunting that's shown to increase conflicts. And it would also perpetuate that harmful myth, which is the idea that native wildlife is at risk is a risk to livestock um, when in 2019 USDA Wildlife Services reported fewer than 300 livestock killings by cougars and that's out of millions of livestock reported in Oregon 
still the largest sources of un unwarranted mortality are weather, illness, and birthing problems. Those cause significantly more losses than all native predators combined. So most depredation losses are easily avoided with non-lethal management practices and the cougar management plan is just not the solution. Research suggests that it might even be part of the problem. So thank you for letting me speak on this issue. Thank you very much, Michelle. And my apologies, I should have told all the people who are commenting, when you are giving your comments, please feel free to turn on your cameras um, if you uh, have cameras, that's just fine. Um, and the next commenter is Kelly Peterson, Oregon Senior State Director of the Humane Society. Hi there. Can you, you can hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay. Good, good morning, Chair Halleck and board members. My name is Kelly Peterson. I'm the Oregon Senior State Director for the Humane Society of the United States, and I'm here in opposition to the draft Cougar Resolution, I'm a native Oregonian growing up for most of my life in Lynn County, uh, graduated from Oregon State University, and I value the role that farmers and ranchers play in Oregon and appreciate the need to protect animals from, from threats. However, as cited in our formal comments, along with Mountain Lion Foundation and others, Cougar conflicts with livestock are exceptionally low in Oregon, especially when compared to other sources of mortality. HSUS is not asking for you to ignore a real threat. Instead, we're asking that the board provide a meaningful approach to support farmers and ranchers. And, and it, that would also include coexistence with cougars and other wildlife as well for, for for background, as you can tell, ODFNW's Cougar Management Plan has long been controversial since it was first implemented because it's focused on promoting hunting of cougars, which is based on unreliable data, as Michelle Blake had also said, while ignoring this valuable and scientific research conducted in other states, including the neighboring state of Washington. And what those studies have shown is that heavy killing of cougars correlates with increased conflicts with humans, pets, and livestock. In fact, we requested that large carnivore expert, Dr. Rob Wilgus, from retired, newly retired from Washington State University be allowed to present the research today so that you could further understand the link between heavy hunting of cougars and conflicts. And while the request was denied, we do hope you'll consider the significance of that research and it's also attached in our formal comments. Uh, the reality is that more cougars are killed today by hunters than compared to when hound hunting was legal in 1994. And also ODFNW's annual hunting quota of 900 cougars amounts to nearly 30% of the mature population. That's double what researchers have found to be sustainable. And it is why we're asking the board to archive the current draft of the Cougar Resolution or instead, you know, replace it with a resolution that focuses on coexisting with Cougars. You know this, you know, very well, there's a wide range of non-lethal strategies and tools to help farmers and ranchers. And you only need to look to Benton County and offers an amazing program called the Agriculture and Wildlife Protection Program. And it's why a resolution on coexistence would be a more meaningful step. And it's why we're in opposition to this resolution as proposed. And we encourage you to archive it or propose something that is based on coexistence. So thank you. Time, please. Thank you, Kelly. And just for the board's edification, um, the, the reason that the uh, person was not invited to speak uh, was a matter of time. Not that we aren't interested if the board chooses to have a subsequent presentation on this issue at any board meeting, um, the board certainly can do that. So I just want to make that clarification. So um, the next person that we have scheduled to speak is Brian Posowitz, who's the Secretary Director of Humane Voters Oregon. Brian, welcome. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair, Chair Halleck. Um, hi, everybody, uh, members of the board. Um, I'm Brian Posowitz, and I'm here today on behalf of Humane Voters Oregon. 
we've been working on cougar issues for approximately the last five years before the Fish and Wildlife Commission and also in the state legislature. I read and commented on the Oregon Cougar Management Plan before it was adopted in 2017. Uh, and I'm here to encourage you not to renew a resolution endorsing the Cougar Management Plan. Primarily, I just wanted to point out that the Cougar Management Plan, as you now know from all the public comments, has many critics, including both wildlife biologists and people who are not biologists, but who are familiar with the science. I can't effectively present all of that criticism in three minutes, but we did submit our written comments on the 2017 plan, and I hope you will take a look at those. To highlight just a couple of points, while the plan purports to encourage non-lethal measures, and you heard um, Mr. Broman say that the department does that, there's really, it has really no specific protocols on uh, what non-lethal measures need to be attempted um, or you know, some sort of an escalating um, path that would uh, result in lethal methods as a last resort. Um, second, uh, and this is probably the most controversial thing, the plan allows uh, indiscriminate so-called management killing of cougars and indiscriminate in the sense that the killing does not target specific problems animals that just goes out with an attempt to reduce cougar numbers on the theory that that will reduce conflict. Um, and that's particularly controversial because one, as you heard, the science is unclear on whether it works and that's acknowledged on page 38 of the Cougar Management Plan. They cite studies that say it may increase conflict. And then it's also controversial because those so-called management killings, as we understand it, um, that those can be done by hunters using packs of dogs, even though that method of hunting was outlawed by ballot measure in 1994 because it's considered inhumane, because voters considered it inhumane. And we sometimes wonder if that's just a way for the hound hunters to continue their sport despite the ballot measure. Uh, like I said, I can't go through all the points in three minutes. I really just want to point out that this is a controversial issue and ask you to consider if you really know enough to take a side in this fight. Uh, I don't think you should simply defer to a sister agency or just take it on faith that they are right and the critics are wrong. Uh, at a minimum, it seems to me that you should allow the critics to present their own scientists um, in less than, in, with more time than three minutes. And as you heard, that request was made um, and, and, and not allowed. And I appreciate the reason for that. Um, but so just given all these issues, um, I would suggest that unless you want to conduct an independent comprehensive review of cougar biology and politics, I would encourage you just to stay out of this fight. Um, and uh, and I, under I understand it's a little incongruous here that this didn't seem to get all this controversy before and, and now it has and I would just say it's a product of the profile in this issue increasing. And I also appreciate that you have no regulatory authority over this. And so to me, that's also an argument for, you know, wh wh why get involved? Why take a stand when there's so much controversy and conflict on this? So thank you for considering my comments. Thank you very much, Brian. Appreciate you uh, taking time to comment today. The next commenter is Todd Nash, Vice President of the Oregon Cattlemen's Association. Yes, thank you for this time. Um, I'm going to keep my comments pretty brief. I'm in support of the resolution that is made here. Um, agriculture and, and predators uh, we deal with all the time on a number of levels, uh, keeping the experts, uh, ODFMW, charged with predator uh, management makes sense. Uh, having this resolution in play to balance those efforts uh, of human uh, livestock and game animal uh, conflicts. Uh, uh, this is a good place for this to reside. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments, Todd. The next commenter is Dennis Sheehy, Wildlife Committee Chair for the Oregon Cattlemen's Association. Hello. Uh, uh, Dennis, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Try again. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, 
my family operates the ranch in Willow County. We're a cow calf operation and we run both on private and public land. And we have a constant interaction with and other large predators. So my perspective on the cougar and the other large predators, which are bear and wolves, is that uh, we have had uh, predation by all three of these large predators. And all, all three of these predators at the least. All three predators have ungulates as their primary food source, which right now their primary food source. And all three of these large predator populations are increasing, at least in northeastern Oregon in zone F, I believe. So my conclusions relative and the uh, new management plan is that one, mule deer populations, which are, have been the primary food cougar, have already crashed in northeastern Oregon, at least. The predator pressure is also a major factor forcing wild ungulates and elk and deer on the private land, which is causing increased depredation of private land. That's being forced from the public land resource. Uh, a large predator, as large predator numbers continue to increase, there's a high potential that elk herds will begin to decline as elk right now are the major food source for the large predators. And if that happens, then it's only logical that domestic or the lice will become the primary food source for all three uh, large predators. Time, please. So, I guess in conclusion, pardon? Yeah, she just in told conclusion, you I think, okay, in conclusion, I think the should continue with the 2017 plan and that it's getting the potential to increase uh, uh, take of uh, cougars and other large predators. Thank you, Dennis, for your comments. Um, the next commenter, commenter is Roger Huffman, Treasurer and Wolf Committee Chair of the Oregon Cattlemen's Association. Do we have Roger with us? Roger, Keep we can't on. hear you. Yes, we do. How's that? Hi. Hi, Roger. Welcome. Uh, Okay, thank you, Chair Halleck and Commission members or uh, board members. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, this is hard to cover in three minutes, obviously, but um, I was at the Department of Ag when the original adoption was done, and and uh, I think you um, did a pretty good job of putting the sideboards on the resolution. It's not, it's not super complex. It's not trying to uh, direct another sister agency in how they should do their business. Um, but it's a recognition that uh, we have um, differing sides and viewpoints. Uh, clearly we have testimony, we have the environmental community that um, you know has their viewpoint, they're very passionate about that. We have uh, viewpoints on the other side, again, on these that are very passionate. Um, and then you've got um, some that are just uh, on the sports side of it. But from a 
from a Department of Ag standpoint, I looked at it when I in charge of the predator stuff at that time as a supportive document um, for the fish and wildlife because they, you know, basically are taking the input from all sides and uh, looking at the actual behavior and the actions and trying to make good decisions on on uh, what's best for the state. And that's that's an individual thing. And even by zone, they've shown. Um, and I think very clearly um, there is a direct benefit when you know there's a uh, conflicting animal that's depredating. If you if you remove that, the, the uh, depredations quit. Um, now I don't know about long term, but I can tell you immediately for that producer, it's it's immediate um, thing and it's effective. So rather than get in the weeds, I guess, uh, on management and all that stuff and try to change this into something that is a management thing that we're directing ODFW to do, uh, I would recommend re-adoption in the current form. Again, it's a supportive document to say we, we acknowledge and recognize that Fish and Wildlife is the experts and they're going to take a balanced approach from all sides. And uh, we think that's the the uh, best avenue and supportive of that. And so I'll leave it at that rather than get down into the fine detail stuff. Thank you for taking the time today, Roger. We appreciate your comments. And the next person is Samantha Bayer, Policy Counsel to the Oregon Farm Bureau. Good afternoon, Chair Halleck, members of the board. Can you guys hear me? Excellent. So as you said, my name is Samantha Bear, Policy Counsel with the Oregon Farm Bureau. I'm actually going to take the opportunity to discuss two different resolutions with you today. Resolution 269 on biofuels and Resolution 275 on cougar management. I'm going to try to be very brief. I'll say Marianne gave me a lot to cover in a short period of time. So uh, first, OFB wants to encourage the board not to move forward with the language in the biofuels resolution that states that the board supports Oregon's clean fuels program. We support ODA providing technical advice and guidance on the administration of the program, but do not believe it's in the best interest of Oregon's farmers and ranchers to express support for the clean fuels program exactly. Currently, the low carbon fuel standard is adding a minimum eight cents a gallon to the price of fuel in Oregon, and that will increase to an added 23 cents a gallon in 2025. With Oregon's farmers and ranchers already operating on very thin margins, this cost increase is going to be significant. On the alternative fuels and biofuel side, there are a number of issues with the compatibility of alternative transportation fuels with current agricultural equipment. While we believe that ODA is well suited to help provide technical advice and guidance on the development of alternative fuels, there remain significant costs and issues associated with Oregon's clean fuels program for Oregon's farmers and ranchers. OFB does not believe that ODA needs to express support for the program to provide effective guidance and input on the development of alternative fuel sources. On the Cougar management side, we also urge you to move forward with resolutions 275 regarding the Cougar management plan as drafted. Oregon's farm and ranch families depend on healthy livestock and spend very long days and nights watching over lambs, kids, and calves. Anyone who lives in an area with cougars knows they are intelligent and opportunistic predators. A dog, a lamb, or calf is easy prey compared to wild game. Without the right tools to fight depredation, Oregon's ranch families are losing thousands of young livestock each year to cougars and other predators, and mothers are being harmed when trying to intervene to protect their young. While we had initial concerns with Oregon's cougar plan, uh, at the outset, it does allow for cougar management in a manner that both protects cougar populations in Oregon while also allowing farmers and ranchers limited but important tools to address cougar depredation. Therefore, we encourage you to move forward with Resolution 275. Thank you, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Samantha. All right, we have two more folks signed up. Um, the next speaker, next person providing comment is Jim Atkinson, Atkinson, the Senior Conservation Director at the Oregon Hunters Association. Are you with us, Jim? Okay, turn on your mic, please. Got it. 
Thank you, Chair Howard. Board members, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you on this topic. Um, as mentioned, I'm the Senior Conservation Director of the Oregon Hunters Association. We have over 10,000 members across the state. And typically, we are the primary hunter spokes spokespeople uh, in regards to interest of about 340,000 uh, licensed hunters in the state of Oregon. Um, as Derek Roman mentioned in his presentation, there was panelists associated with the development and the revision of the future management plan, and we were one of those invited panelists. In fact, I served in that capacity. And um, basically, in a nutshell, we support the plan, and we are advising support of this resolution 275 to uh, ODA. Um, for some pretty fundamental reasons. One is basically what the population has done over the last 35 years, uh, more than doubling, about a 2.5 increase since uh, 1994, when Measure 18, the ban on um, using dogs to hunt cougars was put in effect. And incidentally, prior to that ban, I was an active research doing research with cougars uh, in the northeast corner of the state and i worked actively with houndsmen i totally understand how they operate and uh, the effectiveness that is brought forth with putting uh, cougars in harvestable situations using dogs our organization has wanted to see a renewal of the use of dogs for harvesting cougars in part because of what the cougar population has done. Jim, we're kind of losing your volume a little bit. Okay, how's that? It's better when you're closer. Okay, so basically OHA has had concerns about what the population has done, and we've advocated for the return of the use of dogs for cougar hunting. Obviously that's not in the works. Uh, but the elements for cougar harvest that are incorporated into the plan are proven to be fairly successful at managing the population. That's the reason why we support uh, the current cougar management plan. And I think that there's a bit of a deviation um, in cougar management among academic researchers and those that are managers in the field. And I think if you could pull the district biologists across the state of Oregon, those are the managers in the field, they would be very much in support of hunting cougars. Uh, academia views it differently, and I know this. I've worked both in the management aspect, and I also was a researcher for the University of Idaho for many years doing research with cougars and wolves in the central Idaho wilderness. I just feel strongly that it's, it's like so many things, this division is not healthy. I think academic researchers are too protectionist, and I think the managers in the state have a pulse on what's really going on. And I think that Derek pretty well described that. Thank hey, Jim. We just ran out of time. Do you have some a closing comment? Uh, just encourage the support of Resolution 275. Thank you Thank very you. much for, for speaking today. And the final speaker that I have, Carla, on my list is Scott Beckstead, Director of Campaigns, uh, Animal Wellness Action, and Center for Humane Economy. Do we have Scott with us? Scott, are you there? Well, I guess we don't, Carla. Last last call for Scott Beckstead. If not, then that closes out the public comment for today. And the net, net I will remind the board that we're going to move directly into our panel discussion for the next agenda item, um, which is a, an hour, and so people should take self breaks as appropriate. Um, this is the Ag Land Conservation Panel discussion, and the panelists, um, I'm assuming they're going to speak in this order, or I will have Nellie McAdams tell me otherwise. The panelists are Addie uh, 
forgive me if I mispronounce any names, Candib, American Farmland Trust, Greg Holmes, Thousand Friends of Oregon, Shante Johnson, the Black Oregon Land Trust, Tori Mill, the Coalition of Oregon Land Trust, Nellie McAdams, Oregon Agricultural Trust, and our very own Jim Johnson from the Oregon Department of Agriculture. So um, I've not moderated a panel on Zoom before. So Nellie, maybe I'll let you start and, um, and have people speak as you have organized it, if that works for you. Thank you, Chair Halleck. Um, Chair Halleck and members of the board, it's an honor to be here with you today and to be part of this panel on this important topic. Um, I want to check with Carla. Are you all right with sharing our presentation slides? Yes, I'll pop them up. Thank you so much. Um, so my name, as Chair Halleck said, is Nellie McAdams. I represent the Oregon Agricultural Trust, a statewide agricultural land trust I'll be talking about later. But the general purpose of this panel is to share information about the challenges of protecting and accessing agricultural land in Oregon and the programs and policies that can address these challenges. Um, Chair Halleck, the um, presentation order that you mentioned is indeed correct. Um, we're going to begin this panel by learning from Adi Kandib about recent research from American Farmland Trust on farmland loss. Then we'll learn from Greg Holmes of Thousand Friends about cumulative impacts of non-farm uses on farmland. Um, then Shantae Johnson, who on this panel will be wearing the hat of the Black Oregon Land Trust, will describe some of the many challenges that communities of color in particular face when accessing land and how Bolt is meeting this need. Tori Mill of Coalition of Oregon Land Trust will give an overview of conservation easements and their funding programs. I will share a little bit about OAT and about state and federal advocacy for easement funding. And then Jim Johnson of ODA will bring us home by describing the history of the board's role in this work. And that will be followed by Q&A. So with that, um, I'd like to welcome Addie to begin her presentation. Thank you again. Thank you, Nolly. Can you hear me okay? Great, thanks. I see your thumbs up. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really glad to be here representing American Farmland Trust as the Pacific Northwest Regional Director. And let's go to the next slide. American Farmland Trust, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a national nonprofit organization. And our mission is to save the land that sustains us by protecting farmland, promoting sound farming practices, and keeping farmers on the land. Some of you might know us best by our No Farms, No Food bumper sticker. We are celebrating 40 years this year, and we're headquartered in Washington, DC, but we've had a presence here in the Pacific Northwest since 1997. Next slide. I am here today primarily to talk to you about Farms Under Threat, which is our multi-year and multifaceted national research initiative to analyze the conversion of farm and ranch lands, link our findings to policies and solutions, and predict the impacts of future threats. We released phase two of Farms Under Threat earlier this year, which is Farms Under Threat at the State of the States. Next slide. Before I move into our findings, I wanna talk a little bit about what we see as the leading drivers of ag land conversion. And we see three primary drivers. The first being development pressure. The second being weakening agricultural viability, which leads to consolidation of farmland growing numbers of very large ag businesses and um, decreasing numbers of small and mid-sized businesses. And the third is intergenerational transfer of land. And you can see from this map here that in the Pacific Northwest in particular, older farmers outnumber younger farmers by a number of factors and that puts our farmland at risk. Next slide. So taking a broad view, Farms Under Threat, the state of the states found that between 2001 and 2016, the U.S. converted 11 million acres of agricultural land. And 4.4 million of those were what we would consider nationally significant. And that's land that is best suited for growing crops for human consumption. Next slide. 
When we look at what's happening specifically in Oregon, we see that during the same time period, Oregon converted over 65,000 acres of farmland. And while that's a small fraction of Oregon's farmland, and Oregon is doing much better um, in comparison to some other states for um, comparison, Texas lost over a million acres of farmland during the same time period. Let's go to the next slide here. We can see that conversion is disproportionately impacting Oregon's best land. 67% of the land converted was what we would consider Oregon's best land, and 31% was what we would consider nationally significant. And you can see from this map here, the red is where agricultural land has been converted, and that's happening primarily in the areas of dark green, which represents our best ag land. Next slide. When we talk about conversion, we're talking about two different types of conversion. And the first is urban and highly developed, which is what we typically think of when we tip, tip, uh, think of urban sprawl. That's residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation use. And the second is low density residential development. This is not a new concept, but it's something that um, Farms Under Threat has really mapped for the first time. And LDR shows where housing density has increased to the point that agriculture is either displaced or compromised. And we see that LDR is a precursor to further development nationwide. On average, land that was in LDR in 2001 was 23 times more likely to be further developed by 2016. Next slide. This is particularly important in Oregon, where 50% of the land converted was converted to low density residential use. And the land that was in LDR in Oregon in 2001 was 95 times more likely to be further developed by 2016. And this chart here shows that LDR occurs on a spectrum. All the way on the left, you have large lot housing developments occurring in a predominantly agricultural area. In the middle, you have attractive ag land that's sandwiched on three sides by residential development. And on the right-hand side, you have a predominantly agricultural area where housing density is starting to increase to the point that that ag land is being fragmented. And we know that makes it more difficult to farm. Next slide. So the second piece of farms under threat of the state of the states is something that we call their agricultural land protection scorecard. And we analyzed state level policy response to farmland loss, and we ranked states according to how well they're doing. You can see that Oregon ranked very highly up in the highest 25%. And we'll dive into that a bit more on the next slide. You can go ahead and switch. So we looked at six primary types of policy response, purchase of agricultural conservation easements, land use planning, property taxes, agricultural districts, farm link programs, and state leasing. Again, Oregon scored in the top 12 states for policy response due in large part to the strength of its land use planning program. But every state can do more, and Oregon is no exception. We see that the states that did the best responded to all three of the drivers of conversion that I mentioned at the beginning. So opportunities in Oregon to specifically um, further the efforts include bolstering the purchase of agricultural conservation easements program, which of course in Oregon is the Oregon Ag Heritage Program. This would enable land trusts and other entities in the state to leverage critical federal dollars for farmland protection, supporting land linking and farm transfer and access to land for beginning farmers and other socially disadvantaged groups, and changes to land use planning to address that LDR land use type that I mentioned earlier. And I'm happy to say that Greg's going to talk a bunch more about that in his presentation. Next slide. And at this point, I'd like to change the subject a bit and look forward. AFT has just released some transition recommendations to the incoming Biden-Harris administration. And I wanted to draw your attention to number three. We're asking for the new administration to maximize the potential of the agricultural conservation easement program through USDA NRCS. And we're specifically calling for a one-time investment of $1.5 billion into ASAP ale 
to further farmland protection efforts nationwide. And we would greatly appreciate your support in elevating these recommendations through NASA and with your US um, representatives. So with that, I will take a break and I'm very happy to turn it over to Greg and we'll answer questions at the end of this presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Addy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as Addy mentioned, my name is Greg Holmes. I am the Food Systems Program Director and Southern Oregon Advocate for 1000 Friends of Oregon and also the Vice Chair of the Oregon Community Food System Network. Um, the relevant portions of 1000 Friends' mission to this conversation are working both to keep cities livable and compact so that they don't sprawl out over farmland and also protecting farmland directly using the tools of the statewide land use planning program as it's implemented by each of Oregon's 36 counties. Um, Addy showed findings from their study that demonstrate that Oregon is among the top states in protecting farmland and mentioned that a big reason for that is the strength of the regulatory scheme put in place for our land use planning program. However, um, as this, their study showed, and as we all know, Oregon continues to lose farmland every year. So 1000 Friends of Oregon recently completed a study to figure out how and why that is happening. And it turns out there's no one big major threat that's, that's easy to address. It's a bunch of little things that add up. And if we don't do something about all of those little things, they may eventually kill or cripple ag in this state, which is why we called the report Death by a Thousand Cuts. Next slide, please. To understand um, how this is happening, we need to go back to the origins of the regulatory protections for farmland in Oregon. As you all know, most farming takes place in Oregon on land that's designated exclusive farm use. Not all, um, a lot of farming takes place, for, for instance, grazing in um, forest land, but the land that is protected for farming in Oregon takes place or, or is designated as exclusive farm use. And it's really important to note that when that zone designation was originally created, there was only a handful of uses permitted in that zone that were not related to farming. Next slide. So today we have about um, 16 million acres of land zoned EFU. That number is not going up. Um, it goes down a little bit each year. Um, and that happens despite the, land, the, the EFU designation. Next slide. Part of how that happens is every year, as Addy pointed out, cities um, can expand their boundaries a little bit and they're they're encouraged to not go into farmland but it is possible for them to do so if they can demonstrate a need counties also rezone efu land for other rural uses such as low density residential etc industrial um, those uses combined result in a relatively small amount of efu lost efu land being lost every year but the amount of land that's available for farming actually goes down faster than that most years. And that's not because of rezoning EFU land, but rather because of the proliferation of new uses that the legislature has allowed on EFU land year after year. Next slide. Um, I don't expect everybody to read this right now and I'll come back to it, but I'm putting it up here to uh, make a point, which is with the subcategories available under some of these headings, there are now more than 60 uses available uh, allowed on EFU land in the state of Oregon. Next slide. Some of those uses make sense in a zone that's dedicated for farm uses. Some of them were clearly put on this list as political favors to narrow constituencies and have nothing to do with farming. Many of them were put in place with good intentions, but some of those have been um, sort of stretched and abused and have now become loopholes that are being used uh, to put non-farm related uses on farmland resulting in that land going out of production and worse yet having adverse impacts on neighboring farming operations so really quickly how this happens next use next slide please sorry um, there are some uses that are just outright permitted by state law that counties must approve and um, cannot put additional sidebars on. 
There are a bunch of other uses that counties can allow and can put additional restrictions on. Some counties look at some of those uses and determine that it's that's not a good idea for them without putting strict sideboards on. Other counties um, take a more liberal approach and uh, take a, a very broad view of interpreting what's allowed and how it's allowed. And some of these uses um, that are less well defined are starting to be used more creatively to allow more and more. One of those is called home occupations, which the legislature created in 1983 to allow small home-based businesses such as an accountant that served the community, a tractor mechanic working out of their barn, et cetera. And there were limits on that as far as the number of employees that could work in such a business, that they had to be operated out of existing structures that were permitted in the zone, and that they had to be incidental and subordinate to the farming operation so that farming always remained the primary business on that land. That bill was, that law was amended in 1995 to remove the incidental and subordinate clause. And in recent years, people were getting more and more creative with that provision to locate things on a few land that are, were clearly not anticipated in that bill. Next slide. There's also a lack of enforcement of existing regulations and permit conditions. And that's, that's gonna always be no matter what we think, but some folks just operate something without getting bothering to get a permit. Um, and that happens and that has to be addressed. But others are getting permits for something and then ignoring the conditions of those permit and turning the use or turning the use into something else. Um, for example, um, we know of a wine, winery tasting room that was permitted, not through the winery statute, but through a commercial use in conjunction with farm use, which is another one of these broad categories. Um, and they've turned that winery tasting room into a pizza restaurant with takeout um, located on farmland in violation, direct violation of the conditions of their permit. So enforcement is a problem because of the way enforcement is under-prioritized and underfunded in the state. Um, <clears throat> next slide. I don't think I have to explain to you why it matters that these um, violations are happening and that these uses happen. Um, they take land out of production and impact neighboring operations. Next slide. And they also, over the long term, drive up land values and threaten the critical mass of agriculture in a region. Next slide. So that raises the question again with this list, how exclusive is exclusive farm use in Oregon? And how many more cuts can Oregon agriculture withstand before reaching a critical point? Next slide. The findings of the AFT studies show that what we've known here in decade for in Oregon for decades, which is that our land use program contains the tools necessary to preserve, preserve farmland and the agricultural economy here. 1,000 Friends of Oregon has ideas for how to strengthen those protections, which we are pursuing and which we will ask for help for. But I want to point out these tools are only as strong as the political will to keep the system in place and not to whittle away at the protections. Nothing about it is to be taken for granted. So there are other tools, which the rest of the speakers are going to talk about for permanently protecting farmland that are being used in other places, but for a variety of reasons haven't been used to their full potential here in Oregon. Um, I just want to leave you with the thought that for both far reaching and permanent protections, both of these sets of tools are needed, a strong land use protection program and these other tools. Next slide. Um, thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer questions at the end or offline later. And um, the report, the link to our report was in that last slide. Thank you. Thank you. And I think Shante is next up. Excuse me. Sorry to interrupt, but is there any chance to share again the presentation or something? Because I haven't been able to see any. I was trying to contact Carla, but I don't know. I I, I don't know. It's, the, it's only me. <laughs> okay, that's fine, Carla. I think we, maybe you could work with these folks to get uh, copies of their presentations uh, slides. Right, but right now I, I'm not able to see anything. Just let it know. 
Okay, and Louisa is not able to see um, the presentation. I don't know if anybody else is having any trouble with that. All right, we'll be sure and get the, the materials to you. We'll move on to Shante. All right, great. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'll be switching over my hat from board member to um, representing the Black Oregon Land Trust this morning. Um, just a little bit of background about the Black Oregon Land Trust. Um, it is a fairly new organization and just has recently been established um, over the summer. Um, I am working with a great team of Black um, women leadership from um, backgrounds of farming, um, Black food system, law students, um, birth workers, and um, community organizers. Next slide. So the Black Oregon Land Trust, um, we've had a lot of great support from Oregon State University in helping us to do some research around other culturally specific land trusts across the nation. Um, and our focus in, is going to be on um, supporting the black community around reconnecting to their agricultural roots um, and land preservation. Next slide. Um, I also forgot to mention that um, we are looking at our relationships to indigenous tribes. Um, when we talk about land, we often don't talk about the people that occupied and cared for the land um, before many of us were here. And so we are looking to building our relationships with our local indigenous tribes um, as we are at the same time looking to acquire land for land. Um, so the goal of Black Oregon Land Trust would be to acquire land for black farmers um, so that there is definitely a cultural connection to the land for um, black farmers and black community members, but um, we will be looking at um, agricultural practices, um, being able to provide uh, fresh uh, food options to community members and looking at generational um, wealth um, that is connected to land as well. Next slide. So why are there so uh, few black farmers here in Oregon and why do so few black farmers own land? We can look um, historically at a lot of the broken promises that um, black farmers have experienced nationally. And um, when you look at the, the uh, broken promise of 40 acres and a mule, um, where 40,000 black people that were freed from enslavement were promised land, um, you can definitely see that, that that promise was broken and has con contributed to um, you know, the decline of black farmers being able to be owners and operators. We can also um, look to a lot of the systematic racism um, and um, things that have uh, contributed to land loss, land theft, and um, excuse me, let me just decline my screen because I can't see all of PowerPoint here. Bear with me. Um, we can also look at, you know, the land left, land theft and land loss. Um, in 1920, um, there were 1 million black farmers. And today there are about less than 50,000 um, black farmers nationally that have declined based upon um, racism and a lot of the barriers that have been created by the USDA and other government agencies. When we talk specifically and think about Oregon, we can look to the Oregon Donation Land Act that has helped to um, contribute to giving away land in the allotment of about 320 acres to white homesteaders. And um, black people were excluded from the state and, and also excluded from being able to own and access land. Um, and it was a very hard state for black people to, to live in the state um, during that time still experiencing a lot of um, land loss rapidly. Um, and there is a need for us to look at um, land access data here specifically in Oregon. Um, 
although we do have a, a smaller percentage nationally of black farmers, um, it'd be interesting to really dive deeper into actually how many black farmers are operators here in Oregon, um, which I know the ODA is working, working on uh, collecting some of that data. Next slide. So um, I talked a little bit about, um, you know, some of the problem around um, accessing land for black farmers. Um, black owned farms account for 0.5% of total farmland in the U.S. Um, that is a very small amount. Um, and we do know that 1% um, of farmland in Oregon is owned by black farmers and that the average age of Oregon farmers um, is now 60, as um, other presenters um, in the presentation have pointed out, and that we are going to experience an increase in this change of hands. And the opportunity is really now to, for us to look at um, what other diverse populations have a need for access to land um, to basically build up their farms. So we, it's real important that we, we take a look at this. Nationally, we can look at um, a new bill that has been introduced by Senator uh, uh, Warren called the Justice for Black Farmers Act that really kind of uh, brings up some very um, key points in, and um, pathways into how we can help to create more opportunities for black farmers. Um, so I encourage folks to kind of take a look at that bill. There's a lot of exciting uh, movement and um, opportunities to support black farmers in accessing land. Next slide. So um, what do we wanna do? Um, our vision is that um, Bolt would be able to support black farmers in owning their land. Um, what we have a lot of is black urban farmers being able to access land and being displaced um, because they have um, temporary stewardship. And so as you all know, as you put all of the, the love and intention into loving on the land and building up that soil and building community, um, oftentimes um, farmers are displaced, um, displaced from the land and have to restart and rebuild all over again. And so it's really important um, with all the inputs and all of the blood, sweat and tears that goes into managing the land and growing food for our communities that black farmers have a, a landing spot where they could um, can own the land, build the necessary infrastructure, build up the soil and know that they don't have to move. Um, we all know that land contributes to generational wealth um, and because the denial and access of land um, ownership, um, you know, that has kind of excluded black farmers for being, you know, from being able to even have access to the capital that, that they need to be able to um, tend to the land and really blossom. So, um, we're, you know, our hopes is that Black Oregon Land Trust will have um, land that we can manage, um, build our relationship with indigenous tribes, and also create a place where black farmers can thrive. Uh, next slide. So with the launch of Black Oregon Land Trust, we do kind of, we do have a two year plan. Um, and so right now we are um, in the phase of creating our or organizational governance structure, um, establishing both as um, an official Oregon based land trust. Um, we would like to acquire land through purchases, donations, and working land easements. Um, we would also like to transfer um, stewardship to black farmers. Um, and that could be, you know, in urban settings and also in um, rural settings as well, um, mostly focusing on rural settings. Um, and lastly, collaborating with the Black Food Fund um, our sister organization to provide ongoing support to farmers through mentoring, technical assistance, and operating capital. The black, you know, it's not enough to just um, get on a piece of land. As many of you know, um, it is necessary to have um, access to um, infrastructure. And so, as small producers and also as black farmers, there is a great need for infrastructure. 
Um, I could say that during COVID, um, you know, at my particular farm, we were approached to, you know, to uh, uh, provide probably over, you know, 500 different shares of vegetables um, to community members. And uh, we weren't able to meet that need based upon, um, you know, the lack of infrastructure. And so um, it is absolutely necessary that um, we collaborate with the Black Food Fund to not only set up Black farmers in the future to have access to land, but also to have the necessary infrastructure, mentorship, and support and wraparound services that they need. Uh, next slide. So ways that we're looking for support are um, funding, technical assistance, advocacy, um, connection to resources, and awareness building. I can say that we've got um, some great support. We have um, some support from um, some attorneys um, from, that have also supported the Black Farmers Fund um, nationally. And so we're very thankful for that support. Um, and if you're interested in connecting with us, um, we'd be more than happy to um, work with you all. Next slide. So if you want to reach us, um, you can email me at Black Oregon Land Trust. Again, my name is Shante Johnson. Um, again, we're a very new organization and we're happy um, that we were welcomed with open arms to be a part of this presentation. Um, we, we're still learning a lot and we still hope to um, learn even more in this field and support um, getting black farmers um, back to the land. Thank you. And I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to Tori. Thank you, Shante, and hello, everyone. I really want to thank Director Taylor and the commission members for taking the time to hear from this panel this morning. I especially am and just feeling really grateful for this opportunity to speak with you all. So thank you so much for having us. Uh, so by way of introduction, my name is Tori Mill, and I am the program manager of the Coalition of Oregon Land Trusts, or COLT, as many of our friends and supporters like to call us. Today, I am honored to speak about our coalition's commitment to protecting some of Oregon's most important and threatened farm and ranch lands, uh, to touch upon some of the tools that we have in our toolkit to permanently protect land, and to demonstrate how we could use your support in advancing the pace of agricultural land protection in our state. We want this board of directors to know that there is a robust community of nonprofits in our coalition that has the means and the expertise to permanently protect working lands and to help sustain Oregon's agricultural way of life well into the future. Uh, next slide, please. So COLT is a statewide network of 29 separate nonprofit conservation organizations that work across the Oregon landscape from the coast to the high desert and all of the places in between. Our members are diverse in size, ranging from small community-based groups to multinational organizations like the Nature Conservancy. But no matter their size or their geography, all of Colt's members share the common vision to make Oregon a better place to live for this generation and all to come. And they fulfill this vision through permanently protecting the very lands on which Oregonians rely to grow food and fiber, to enjoy and recreate, and to share with our critter friends. Next slide, please. So Colt was created in 2012 because Oregon Land Trust believed that they were stronger together than they were as individuals. And their collaboration has really led to impact. We have been able to leverage voices from all over the state, including the voices of private landowners, elected officials, and government agencies, all who support the work of land trusts. Together, Colt members have protected nearly half a million acres, which is a land base that's comparable to our state park system. Land trust properties include trails with universal access for all, places to bird watch, walk pets, and of course, they include some of our most precious working lands. Next slide. So Colt's core purpose is to build community and to advocate on behalf of land trusts. We advocate on the state and federal 
calls for programs that support conservation and permanent land protection. And we work to bridge gaps between funders, community groups, agencies, and a broad array of other stakeholders to tie them to our collective mission and maximize Oregon Land Trust's impact on the ground. Next slide. Protecting agricultural lands remains a front and center policy priority for our membership. Each of our members is acutely aware that we in Oregon have a growing problem regarding the loss of our agricultural lands, and many of our land trusts have dedicated their work to ensuring that Oregon's agricultural lands remain intact and operational into the future. Next slide. So we all know the critical public values that our agricultural lands provide, so I don't want to take too much time here explaining just how important our agricultural lands are, but I do want to highlight some of the main reasons why land trusts have dedicated themselves to protecting agricultural lands. As Addie and Greg highlighted, our agricultural lands in Oregon are facing many, many threats, and the preservation of these lands has a really far-reaching impact on our state. From bolstering our economy to sustaining our rural communities, protecting wildlife migratory corridors, providing water filtration and carbon sequestration, our agricultural lands are so vital to the overall health and well being of Oregonians in every sense. Next slide. Land trusts conserve land through two mechanisms either through protecting the land, purchasing land outright through fee title acquisition or by working with willing landowners to place a conservation easement on a property, which is the means that I'll be focusing on today. Uh, I only have 10 minutes for this presentation and unpacking conservation easements could probably take an entire week long conference, but I did want to distill it down for you in case you're not familiar with what a conservation easement is and how land trusts can use them. So essentially a conservation easement is a legally binding perpetual agreement that allows a landowner to give up one or more of their private property rights and restricts certain uses on the subject property that could otherwise diminish its conservation values. Easements can be purchased or donated, but in all cases, they are completely voluntary agreements. Sometimes it helps to think about land ownership as a bundle of sticks or a bundle of rights, um, which include, to name just a few, the right to occupy, to lease, to sell, to farm or harvest timber, among many others. Uh, and a conservation easement essentially removes some of those sticks out of the bundle, most commonly the rights to subdivide and to develop. And it's important to note here that even though the landowner removes some of the sticks out of their bundle, they still retain full private property ownership of the land. Next slide, please. I also wanted to point just really quickly to the enabling statute in Oregon that was passed in 1967, which permits an easement holder to impose limitations on real property to ensure its availability for future use, which includes agricultural use. Eligible easement holders in Oregon include the state, soil and water conservation districts, and nonprofit organizations like our member land trusts. Next slide. Sometimes it helps to think about what conservation easements don't do in order to, to better understand the mechanisms by which they actually work, um, because there are a lot of misconceptions and myths floating around out there about easements. So conservation easements do not automatically provide for public access unless it is specifically um, specified in the document. They don't take the land out of production, and in fact, many working lands easements may actually encourage that the land stay in production. They don't put the land into public ownership. As I've already mentioned, the landowner retains full private property rights, except for the ones they surrender, and they don't take the land off the tax rolls. They also don't grant management of the land to the easement holder. Next slide, please. Conservation easements have so many benefits, including helping to protect a family's legacy by assisting with succession planning and keeping parcels intact as they're passed from one generation to the next. They help to maintain a viable base of working lands in our state by complementing our land use system and prohibiting certain uses that could otherwise diminish our ability to use them in the future. 
and they provide multiple incentives to landowners, including federal and state income tax deductions, estate tax benefits, and sometimes monetary compensation for the purchase of the easement value. Next slide. There are so many opportunities for agricultural easements in Oregon. We, we currently have about 16 land trusts and five soil and water conservation districts who all want to hold working land easements. In addition to many willing landowners who have approached these potential easement holders and expressed interest in putting easements on their property. But to date, there have been relatively few working lands easements actually completed in Oregon. The good news here is that there is a robust federal program that assists conservation entities in securing conservation easements with the explicit purpose of protecting agricultural lands. The U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service administers a Farm Bill pro program called the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program, or ASIP. Uh, with over $450 million available nationwide on an annual basis. NRCS's Agricultural Land Easement Program, ASAP Ale, is the number one tool used by land trusts around the country to permanently protect working farms and ranches. Through ASAP Ale, the NRCS will cost share the purchase of easements on farms and ranch lands and provide 50% of the easement value for any given project. The other 50% of the easement value is the responsibility of the land trust and the landowner to bring to the table to match that federal contribution. The bad news is that land trusts in Oregon have been really hard pressed to fully utilize the federal funds that are available. We in Oregon are one of 22 other states that does not have a statewide funding program that's compatible with providing a non-federal match to cost share ASIP ale easements, which means we're leaving millions of dollars of federal assistance on the table for agricultural conservation in Oregon. Colt was one of the architects behind the Oregon Agricultural Heritage Program, a program that was specifically designed to help Oregon farmers and ranchers strategize for succession planning and help to permanently protect farmland for future generations. That program passed the legislature in 2017, but it remains unfunded. And this is a program that could act as Oregon's stateside match to NRCS's ASAP Ale program and immediately fund multiple farm protection projects in Oregon. Next slide, please. This graphic just kind of helps to paint a picture of how the matrix of funding works for ASAP Ale projects. Um, as I've already mentioned, NRCS will provide 50% the other 50% coming from a mixture of a landowner donation and uh, land trust contribution. And the Oregon Agricultural Heritage Program could fit in there to complement and match the, not the federal contribution. Um, next slide, please. And this graphic, it's a little bit hard to read the text, but really I just wanted to give you all a sense of where Oregon ranks compared to other states when it comes to the federal assistance we've received in previous fiscal years. And you can see we're coming in um, near the bottom. So there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of how many federal dollars Oregon's bringing in for agricultural easements. Next slide. Oregon land trusts are so fortunate to have a supportive Oregon NRCS staff who have really prioritized their relationship and partnership with Colt. And our members are actively participating in ongoing coordination with national conservation groups and are already thinking about the next farm bill. And that's where we could really use your support. We need Oregon voices to convey just how critical land protection is for Oregon's agricultural economy and to help us demonstrate the impacts that more funding could have in our state. We need champions in Oregon's agricultural sector as the next farm bill comes up to convey our need on the federal side, and perhaps more importantly, to continue to push forward and get the Oregon Agricultural Heritage Program funded so that we have a stateside match for those federal dollars. Looking at the budget forecast for this year, there's really no spare change for new pro programs with the ongoing pandemic, but we do wanna keep the conversation alive and continue to educate our legislators on the importance of agricultural land protection in Oregon. 
We want to keep the, the leaders of Oregon's agricultural sector engaged, inspired, and along for the journey as we continue to seek new and innovative sources of funding to accomplish this important work. And this photo here was taken in Wallowa County at a cult board meeting a few years back. The cult board meets on a quarterly basis, and we've all agreed that we want to be more closely connected to ODA on our farmland protection efforts. And we hope to convey to you that land trust may not be the only solution to Oregon's land use problems, but we are certainly part of the answer. So thank you so much for your time today, and please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. And I will pass it over now back to Chair Halleck. Um, actually, I think I'm, I'm next, Tori, but thank you so much for presenting. Um, my name is Nellie McAdams with the Oregon Agricultural Trust. And um, I'll just be sharing briefly about our organization and following up with some of the advocacy efforts around the state and federal funding sources that Tori just mentioned. So Oregon Agricultural Trust, or OAT, is a statewide agricultural land trust with a mission to partner with farmers and ranchers to protect agricultural lands for the benefit of Oregon's economy, communities, and landscapes. And what I just want to emphasize is we are working on two levels here, both on land protection and supporting farmers and ranchers now and into the future who are stewarding those lands. Next slide, please. So what does that entail? Um, like Bolt, like the land trust that Tori mentioned, we hold working lands easements. Um, we will also hold land in fee title, so we can hold ownership of land, um, always making it available for agriculture or sale um, to a farmer or ranch rancher. We also provide technical assistance to other working land easement holders. Um, so helping to ensure that any easement holder that wants to provide this service to farmers and ranchers can do this effectively. We also educate farmers, ranchers, attorneys, accountants, um, and others about easements and farm succession to try and build a stronger bench um, for land transition to the next generation, be they to family members or non-family members. And then we advocate alongside of state and national leaders, um, such as Colt, such as AFT, to um, primarily support funding programs to protect agricultural land. Next slide, please. Um, so, OAT really has only launched in January 2020, but we were under development for about three years before then, and were formed because of a need identified by agricultural and conservation leaders, and um, really all of our planning processes have been informed by them as well. So from feasibility study to business plan to strategic plan, and then now entering conservation planning. Um, it's our goal to meet uh, the needs of farmers and ranchers for land protection. We have a staff of three um, that will be five in January 2021. And we have a board of six that will be growing to eight at the beginning of next year and, and hopefully growing also beyond then too. Um, in pre-COVID times, our office was in Salem. Right now we're all working from home as many of you are as well. Um, but we do have a statewide presence with several focus areas. Next slide, please. So we are starting in four focus areas, primarily because of the threat of ag land conversion, the interest from landowners and the value of easements in these areas. Um, and also um, importantly, because there are no major regional easement holders who focus exclusively on working lands easements in these areas. So right now, the green areas are our priority areas of the gorge, the mid and south Willamette Valley, and southeast Oregon, with a close second being the north coast. And we have projects that are under development in um, three of these areas right now. Next slide, please. Um, moving to the funding sources, as Tori mentioned, Oregon does have an easement match program in the Agri Oregon Agricultural Heritage Program that is currently unfunded. Next slide, please. Um, however, um, OWEB, which uh, manages this program, has submitted a policy option package to allow that agency to receive and expend in grants up to $5 million of non-state public and private funding. So um, there is not going to be a direct funding request um, from the governor or legislature in the 2021 session. 
However, um, OWEB is allowed by statute to accept non-state funding sources that it can then move through those program criteria that were established by the Oregon Agricultural Heritage Commission. Um, I should say, however, that donations to um, OWEB, so if a private foundation were to donate, those donations are not tax deductible. Next slide, please. Regarding the federal funding source and um, the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program for Agricultural Land Easements, um, OAT is working closely with um, these regional and um, national leaders, uh, the Land Trust Alliance, the Partnership of Rangeland Trusts, American Farmland Trust, and of course, Colt. Next slide, please. Um, some of the policy proposals that are being recommended right now, in addition to what Addie first mentioned, of a $1.5 billion infusion into this program to assist with immediate COVID relief, um, that's an AFT policy um, proposal, um, is in the 2023 bill to triple the funding for ASAP AL to $1.3 billion. Um, tripled funding matches the actual demand for this program and it is being categorized as a way to help farmers and ranchers deal with some of the economic fallout from uh, the pandemic and to help um, with uh, climate change mitigation. Um, another proposal is to increase the federal match. As Tori said, right now, ASAPL can only fund 50% of easement value, but the proposal is to allow that to be 80% of um, easement value that ASAPL can fund. Um, the reason for this in part right now is because Oregon is not alone in having a state um, budgetary crisis and many other states um, will be cutting funds to their easement match programs. Um, so this would help more landowners and land trust access those funds. And um, one more uh, proposal is to allow ASAP Gale to fund um, project costs such as staff time, surveys, appraisals, all of the things that end up costing about $50,000 per easement project. Um, that would allow ASAP Ale to fund those costs as well. And there is significant bipartisan support in both the Senate and House Ag Committees at this point for this proposal. Next slide, please. Um, so that is the end of my presentation, just a little pitch for a virtual auction, which is going on right now. Today is Wine Wednesday. Um, you can go to our website to check it out. Um, but um, on that note, I will pass it over to Jim Johnson of um, ODA to speak about the um, Board of Agriculture's involvement. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, wish that we were in person, but of course not. So, um, uh, if, if Carl, if you go to the, there you go. I, I'm not gonna take a lot of time because I figure you guys can ask questions and if there's something you specifically like me to address, we'll go there. But I just wanted to remind the board um, how active uh, the board has been over the years in land use. I'm, I'm very proud um, to have staffed the board um, uh, as it relates, as it works on its land use resolutions. You have eight resolutions that are land use related. Uh, and there, there's, here's the uh, first set. And then uh, you, so you can see we, we're dealing with everything from urban growth to aggregate mining to other non-farm uses and agritourism. Next slide, please. Um, and then of course, uh, to other issues related to con conversion and this quality of farmland. We have our own easements policy there, for example. And then, of course, energy facility siding. Um, and of course, as you all know, any of you that know that have worked with me, on, there's always land use issues going, and I've got a whole list I could talk about that I won't talk about today. Um, and and so I don't expect that the board will be straying away from working on on issues related to land use. Um, Chair Halleck, I'll leave it at that right now because I I don't want to take up any time away from questions and the like. I, you know, all of you that know me know that I could have took up the whole hour and still not been finished. So. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. And thank you very much to the panel. I sure learned a lot. I don't know about anybody else. So do the board members have uh, questions for any of the, the panelists? And I guess maybe the easiest way is to just fire off your question unless you know who the person is who can answer it and they can decide who's best to answer. So any, any questions from the panel? I mean, excuse me, for the panel. I always want to ask before I jump in, because I always have questions. All right, since people are being shy, I will start. Um, obviously, I am concerned about the list of uh, exceptions that has developed over the years. 
and I don't know if this is for Jim or who can answer this or for Greg, it, is that the result of statutory changes, regulatory changes, actions at the county level, and and how can that, this may be too big of a question, what can be done to um, address that huge list and, and or keep it from becoming longer? Greg, you want me to take this or you want to take it? Um, why don't you go ahead and I'll fill in if I think it needs it. Thanks. Sure. Um, you know, Stephanie, this this is um, this is probably um, the, the the largest issue that I deal with on a day to day basis, and that's the cumulative impact of of uh, the approval of non farm uses on on farmland. And that long list of uses, unlike um, any of the other planning designations in the Oregon Planning Program, that long list of uses is designated by the legislature, is established by the legislature. It is in statute. It is not administrative rule. Um, now, some of that could be addressed through administrative rule by LCDC um, actually being more restrictive or, or adding definition to some of those things. And they have done that over the years, but there's a lot of work that they could do there by simply defining what some of the terms mean. Um, and, you know, I could spend a lot of time on that. Um, but th there's also the issue of cumulative impact and, 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 and the analysis of how these these uses, in, not just individually, but as a as a group, impact surrounding farming operations, and that could be better addressed by by administrative rule at the LCDC level. Also, um, you know, certain uses are required to be reviewed for their cumulative impact, but not all land uses. In fact, I'd say the vast majority of of the non uses are not uh, required to be reviewed for the cumulative impacts to, to agricultural land. And um, lastly, I think one of the biggest holes in the whole evaluation of non-farm development is for most non-farm uses, there's no consideration of the issue of conversion. It's all about impacts to, to existing operations, but it doesn't talk about the loss of farmland that would be associated with those uses individually and cumulatively. I, thanks, Jim. I would just add that um, the report that I provided the link to, Death by a Thousand Cuts, has um, a list of 10 areas that we would recommend being focused on um, that include things like reducing the length of that list and defining some of the terms. I, I mentioned a couple of them that are, are being used pretty liberally right now. And so I'd recommend folks who are curious about that to go to that report because you will see um, some more options of what can be done about some of these things. Thank you. That reminds me to say Carla will post all these um, materials on the website with the meeting material. So you'll be able to get everything. Um, just one quick follow up on the enforcement issue it, on, on uh, those um, uses or whatever the right terminology. Is that it? Is the enforcement at the county level or is it with DLCD or does it vary? Um, enforcement is left largely to the counties. Uh, so, and, and unfortunately it's underfunded almost across the board, every county. And it's also generally complaint driven. They have to receive a complaint from somebody, most of them before they will go out and enforce some of these things. So. Um, which obviously creates awkwardness in the communities. So that's an issue as well. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Other board member questions for any of the panel. Could I add to that, please? Sure. Yeah, I, I, I would. I would point out though that uh, LCDC does have the authority to take enforcement action against counties that are not implementing the planning program uh, per, pursuant to law. Um, one of the last things I did when I when I worked at DLCD before I came over to the Department of Agriculture was work on an enforcement order against uh, Washington County for approval of um, uh, dwellings on farmland that didn't comply with state law. So the DLCD and, and LCDC can take enforcement actions also. Okay, thank you, Jim. Any other questions from board members? Yeah, Chairman Halleck, uh, Elon Miller here, and, and uh, I actually 20 years ago served on the American Farmland Trust Board and then administered the Williamson Act uh, when I was Director of Conservation in, in California, but I haven't recently been focused, so I just want to thank the group for an excellent presentation, but there's a lot there. 
and I guess as we kind of look at priorities and what makes sense as far as as how agriculture needs to look at these issues going forward and any potential for change. Um, you know, enforcement was just touched on. In fact, I was going to ask the question, is it is it an enforcement issue or are we also talking about statutory beyond administrative? So anybody, I'll open that to anybody. Well, I'll take that on. I it's it's um, it, Ellen. It's 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 all of those. Um, you know, one of the one of the things about the land use planning program is it's very diverse. Um, there are all you know it, we, we're using multiple tools. It's not just the re land use regulations, but it is easements. It is it is taxation programs. It is right to farm. There's all kinds of different tools there and, and the like. Um, a lot of the change can happen. You know legislatively or administratively but it also can happen locally too there's a lot of things that can happen at the local level so um one of the great things about what i do is the diversity and it's one of the things that keeps me jumping and you know i i really appreciate that sometimes so did elin did that answer your question well, not exactly, but but I think because it, this is such a huge issue, and I think one of the earlier speakers said we could spend a ton of time on it. Um, again, kind of boiling it down to to some of the priorities that we might want to talk about further at further board meetings is is a thought. Okay, I think we can maybe Jim, you could confer with the folks on this panel, and and there may be some issues we want to form work groups around or whatever. But as you said in your presentation, land use is an ongoing conversation for this board. So I think the panel today has just added further fuel to uh, all of the land use issues that we deal with as a board, and really appreciate you all spending time with us today. Thank you, Chair Halleck. If, yes. if, I, if I could just add, you know, one of the things that I've actually been working on um, with Jim, with Nellie, is a resolution um, to go through NASDA on some of the um, changes around, particularly the ASEP program that USDA administers, that, that percentage of local um, state match needed from 50 to 80 percent. And so I'm going to be shopping that to some of my colleagues in other states who have had similar challenges and will continue as states are having um, tough budget situations, largely in part due to COVID, um, and then bringing that before the full NASDA um, body um, for potential ad discussion and adoption at the national level because that's another way that we can try to influence federal policy. Um, for those, for our new board members who don't know, NASDA is the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture. And so it's the uh, director, secretaries, commissioner of ag um, from the uh, 50 states and then our four U.S. territories are all members. We meet twice a year. Uh, and I think it's really good timing as um, we are going into an administration change, but also as we are gearing up for the 2023-2023 Farm Bill as well. So that's one additional avenue that we're um, looking at. Thank you, Director Taylor. Well, thank you, panel. We will move on to our board business, but it was uh, really nice to see you all and a really great information. Thank you, Nellie, for bringing it to our attention. Thank you much. Uh, for having us. Thank you. All right. Um, on we go to board business. Um, and the first item is the in your packet or material or online. You should have uh, received the reports, written report from all of the ODA program areas. And this time on our board business agenda is for board members to ask any questions they might have about those um, various reports. Um, I'll just start off. I'd like to compliment the, um, the program, the various programs. I noticed shellfish in particular, the dairy program. Um, there were several who, of you who've noted in your reports that you're ability to continue on with your program activities and meet your commitments and inspections even given covid and i think that's really i'd like to just commend you all for being able to do that um, i noticed that the wolf grant program got some uh, was successful in getting all the parties to agree on the the claim application that process i always like to see 
when collaborative processes work out. Um, I also noticed um, unfortunately, if I can find it, that we lost Margaret Matter or Mater, how are you pronounce? Yes, she was. Some of you may have made, might have heard, remember her presentations on water quantity, and she's gone to Colorado apparently. So that that was um, uh, uh, unfortunate for us, but I guess a good thing for her. And I'm trying not to take too much time. Um, uh, Chlorpyrifrost, there was a mention um, that we received 2,507 comment emails. I was just curious from the director or from Stephanie Page, what was the gist of those comments? That's a lot. Uh, Chair Halleck, I'm not sure if Stephanie's on. Oh, she is on. Sorry, I knew she was having juggling between a couple meetings. But I think from my read of them, they really ran the gamut um, um, on on various parts of the uh, the proposed rule that we had, whether it be um, it was too restrictive or not restrictive enough. I think on each component, we we got uh, comments from kind of the full spectrum. Um, um, from various sides. Uh, Stephanie, I don't know if you want to add anything there. I, I think that's perfect. That's what I would have said as well. Okay, thank you. Um, oh yeah, the other uh, program that did, got its work done during COVID was a seed field inspection program. Um, so congratulations to you folks. Um, I also thought that in smoke management that it was very creative to use the bales from the fields that could not be burned is um, in the restoration efforts in the areas affected by wildfire fires. So that was good for you guys to come up with that. And in the interest of time, I think that's all. But I, I do want to, I'm going to ask other board members if they have questions. But I do want to encourage you all to read these program reports. We get them for every board meeting, and the programs go to a lot of time and trouble to put them together. So does anybody else have any questions or comments on this round of the program area reports? OK, so um, we'll move on to, I think, Barbara Boyer for the report on OWEB. She, yep. Barbara is our liaison to the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. Yes, and I apologize. I still couldn't get my darn camera to work. So you're just going to have to listen to me and imagine what I look like. Um, so I had the opportunity to take some d diversity, equity, and inclusion training through OWEB. Um, it was a statewide training. 2,500 people, I think, was the number I got that attended. It was over the course of three days, and I took 16 hours of training. Uh, there was 18 and a half offered, but I couldn't make some of the sessions. So uh, it was enlightening, and there were speakers from all of the United States. So um, if anybody gets the opportunity to take that training, I would suggest it. They do it yearly. And then we had an emergency wildfire meeting um, on October 30th to um, to respond to the wildfires uh, that happened this last summer. Um, and we were considering, um, let's see, pr um, prioritizing some emergency funds to the 13 uh, wildfire areas. So $75,000 is being offered per wildfire for erosion. And they're asking for collaboration in all 13 of these areas. Um, there was originally 14 areas, but we figured that one of the fires was on public land. And so we could not offer that um, grant money for that particular uh, region. And in August, we had an update that we received 80% of our normal funding because um, uh, Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board is um, primarily funded through lottery dollars. So we were very um, happy with that news um, at the beginning of September, but with the recent freeze, um, I think next week we're not going to be hearing such good news. 
Uh, so stay tuned. I have a two-day meeting next week um, with, with OWEB. And I think that is all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Anybody have any questions for Barbara? Okay, I think what we'll do next is we received a subsequent email on the Oregon Acidification Council position. I believe the, uh, the board has to uh, make a recommendation or approve of that. Director Taylor will fill us in, but there's, my understanding is there's only one candidate, so perhaps you could lead us through that. Yeah, um, so, uh, there is a 13 member council um, and I hope you all had a chance to read the memo that provides recommendations uh, to the state on responding to ocean acidification and hypo uh, hypoxia. Um, um, ODA has a representative on it um, but there are some that are um, um, appointed by the governor but there are several commissions and boards that make recommendations for um, to represent certain sectors. Uh, the Board of Ag has responsibility for one of those kind of representing um, the cultivation of fish uh, for food um, as a sector. Uh, we had, um, we, we, there, there had been a gentleman appointed and he uh, kind of had run his term out and decided not to um, um, reapply or to continue to serve. So I forget exactly when he stepped off, but it was maybe earlier this year. Uh, we went out um, with a um, several press releases. We reached out to industry to try and see if there's anyone um, from uh, the Oregon um, seafood uh, industry that would be interested in. Um, after um, several months of work, um, we have identified an individual who has applied. Um, you had um, um, Kristen uh, Penner's uh, application. And so the board uh, now has the ability to either provide a recommendation to be appointed to the council, which we will then pass along um, to the governor's office for consideration, um, or we could continue to try and look uh, for additional representation. And happy to, if there are any questions about this. Uh, we don't do many of these as a, for the new members of the Board of Agriculture, but um, this is one. And then um, the uh, Oregon Agriculture Heritage Commission uh, is another one where the board uh, makes recommendations um, to uh, the OWEB board. Um, um, and so that's another one you'll see some of them come up on. Okay, any questions for Director Taylor um, before I ask uh, the board's wishes? Okay, um, so I'll just, I will just put a motion on the table to recommend Kristen Penner. Uh, we, are, we are recommending, who are we recommending to, Director Taylor? It, we are making a recommendation to another entity to appoint her, or we just recommend that she be appointed. I'm going to actually ask Carla if she's on, if she knows, or. Um, it says, the, uh, in consultation with the governor's office. So we would be making a recommendation to the governor's okay. office okay. to support that candidate. Okay, so that I, I would move that we make a recommendation to the governor's office to support Kristen Penner um, for this council. Is there a second? <clears throat> Tyson Raymond, I'll second. Okay, is there any discussion? All right, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Good work. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Please send our good wishes to Kristen. Um, okay, now we need to get into the resolutions. And so we have two issues we have the actions that we need to take on resolutions today and then we have um i guess just to mention carla has sent out a uh, an email asking people to indicate their preference for uh being on a new work group for the look at the resolutions that we're doing for 2021 
So for today, um, we have, and I think Stephanie Page will probably be in charge of this. We have three <coughs> resolutions. Uh, we have 69, which is on biofuels. We have 275 on the Cougar Management Plan, and we have 305, uh, the Native Plant Conservation Program. So do you want to say anything? Uh, sure. I think I think you were talking to me, Carla. There was some rustling, so hopefully I'm not cutting anyone off here. But I was just going to summarize the work group's um, work last night and recommendations on the three resolutions. So first resolution was the biofuels resolution. At the board's September meeting, the work group asked for some additional work on this resolution, expressing support for the state's um, low carbon fuel standard. So Jason Barber worked with Stephen Harrington, who's the Weights and Measures and Motor Fuels Program Manager, to add some language. Um, we had received a question um, shortly before the board, before this month's board meeting, about the scope of the resolution and whether it was clear what types of fuels the resolution, resolution applies to. Jason re-reviewed the language in the resolution with this question in mind. And he noted that it covers um, nationally recognized consensus-based alternative transportation fuels. So his thought was that it covers it and that it is helpful to have this broad type of language um, because it's more timeless than, than listing or recognizing specific types of fuels. So on this one, the work group decided to forward the resolution to the full board and discuss next steps following public comment, um, anticipating some public comment would be received today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, next resolution was the Cougar Management Resolution. This resolution um, has not been changed since the minor technical edits were made uh, before the September board meeting. Um, because of the public comments received prior to the September board meeting um, regarding scientific literature related to cougar removal, the board decided to invite Derek Broman from ODFW, who you heard from earlier this morning, to provide some more information about scientific studies around cougar removal. So on this resolution, the work group decided to forward it to the full board to discuss next steps following public comment. And then finally, the work group um, reviewed an updated version of the native plant resolution. So this was another one where um, at the September meeting, the work group recommended rewording the resolution and bringing it back for consideration at this meeting. Um, the rewording basically changed it from supporting funding for the program because you could theoretically have a resolution like that for every single program at ODA. It changed it to recognizing the program's statutorily mandated responsibilities. And the work group recommended forwarding this resolution to the full board for approval. Okay, I guess um, we might as well take it from the top, Steph, unless you want to do it in any particular order. So if we just start with the biofuels, um, and just so everybody is clear, the way you read these um, documents is the resolution was on the books since 2005. So anything that you see in black, like, if, I don't know how your printers work, but that was the language of the original uh, resolution, and then all of the underlined um, language, whether it's black or otherwise, is new language that's being proposed in this. So shall we, um, I guess the way I do this is I would entertain, we, we, need, we want action on this one, right, Steph? Have I lost her? Sorry, I was double muted, yeah. Okay, so um, I would entertain a motion on this um, resolution, and obviously if we get a motion in a second, then we can have some discussion. I'll move to adopt. That was Tyson Thank Raymond, you. do we have a second? Brian Harper, I'll second. Thank you, Brian Harper. Okay, discussion? Well, I have a question here <laughs> that has been running in my mind about the biofuels. 
um, when you had this resolution was because the, some there is some mm, how can I say it? somebody producing biofuels in Oregon. What was the idea about that? What is the in, I, I, something I'm missing some, that information in some place in the history of this resolution. So is of, uh, you are taking care right now only they produce clean products or biofuels, but who is producing these biofuels in Oregon? What is that important? O o Oregon is going to buy biofuels. So that is something I kind of missing that information. I don't know if it has sense or not. <laughs> Sure. Um, hey, this is oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jason. Oh, you bet. Um, let me see here. So a little bit of the history probably helps here. Yeah. So uh, this was went into effect originally in '05. So that was kind of right before the uh, Oregon's renewable fuel standard got up and running. So I think this went into effect to kind of promote ethanol and biodiesel production in the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. And since that time, there have been some small production operations that have started up and gone for a few years. Ones that come to mind is uh, Beaver Biodiesel out of the Corvallis area. Mm -hmm. There were some down in Southern Oregon. Klask and I uh, always seems to be toying with the idea of getting something up and running. But right now, there are really only two uh, producers in the state, um, sequential biofuels in Oregon, which produces biodiesel, and okay. then uh, Pacific Ethanol over there near Hermiston. And they were also, there was a Z-Chem a uh, company right by Pacific Ethanol that shot up, and that was the uh, reason for all those popular trees that were growing over there, because they discovered some new bacteria that was able to break down um, woody pulp uh, type of feedstock. But they, uh, I think, have since kind of gone under, and the last I knew that uh, Pacific Ethanol was kind of managing that plant, but I'm not sure there was any production going on there. So we went through, this is like the third board meeting I think this has been to, um, and we went through and changed a lot of the wording. There was some wording in here about funding, and so we had to change that because the motor fuel quality program is funded right now through a uh, $10 assessment that every fuel meter in Oregon is assessed a $10 fee. That okay. generates about $350 a year and that is used to run the motor fuel quality program. So we kind of had to change that wording. And then I think the last meeting, Marty and maybe someone else wanted to add in the uh, clean fuels program that DEQ administers. So those two new red paragraphs are kind of uh, Stephen Harrington's addition to the first paragraph kind of explains what that program does, kind of the goal of greenhouse uh, elimination. And then the uh, second paragraph just talks about how we would support that program through the work that we do uh, in the motor fuel quality program. All right. Okay, thank you. So, Luisa, did that, did that answer your question? Yes, but it has changed or evolved it's from the initial thing. What based on somebody starting to produce biofuels now, it is different, kind of. So, mm, it's not yeah. from the beginning. We're thinking about, you know, supporting research in biofuels. Now you are talking about biofuels as uh, you need to consider you get biofuels more clean products or testing laboratory use that is different so not much research in biofuels that i am aware of somebody producing here different sources of biofuels that could be produced is still some areas in research so and it's really expensive so i don't see that that will happen someday so but it is possible mm -hmm. okay grant where did you want to say something 
Uh, regarding the biofuels? Yeah, I just saw no. your mic was on. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That's no problem. Um, can can somebody, Elin, did you want to say something? Yeah, I did have a question. Um, one of the, the presenters um, during the comment period talked about the increase for farmers as far as those costs, and that may already be a statutory thing that we don't, anyway, could somebody just, I don't know if there's a real easy way to explain um, why this resolution wouldn't necessarily promote the increase of the cost when if, if it's already gonna be happening because of statute or other things that DEQ is doing. Yeah. Can anybody sort that for me? That's a good point. Yeah, I think that was, uh, what was her name? Samantha Boyer at kind of two points. The first one was that she did not want us to support the clean fuels program. She wanted us to remove those two paragraphs and went on to say that that has caused um, an increase, I think it was an eight, per, eight cent increase per gallon. Um, and then her second point was that alternative fuels were not really good for farm equipment. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't know enough about the clean fuel program to really address that concern, but yeah. Jason, is Stephanie on? Stephanie, could you speak to this? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I think that that is a concern that we have periodically heard. Both of those, I would say, is um, impacts in terms of of cost to um, to farmers and ranchers from the fuel from the fuel standards, and then. Um, it kind of indirect effects to feed feed and other input costs, um, and then we we have heard uh, concerns regarding impacts to farm equipment, um, small engines, those kinds of things. One one thing that was done related to the renewable fuel standard for ethanol was to carve out um, an exception for certain certain types of engines or um, an allowance for for fuel that doesn't contain ethanol to try and address that particular concern. But yeah, I, I do think those are all concerns that we hear periodically. Another big concern early on was the, uh, with farm equipment and having to use biodiesel is it's more prone to gel during uh, winter, winter months. And we did see that uh, when I first got to the uh, agency in 09, 010, and maybe 011. But since that time, uh, we really have not seen any major gelling problems in the winter. The uh, uh, wholesalers and producers of that fuel have done a really good job of winterizing that down to minus 40 degrees. Um, so that, that really has not been a problem for the last several years here in Oregon. All right, is there further discussion? Chair sure, Alec, Tyson Raymond for the record. Um, I, I hear Sam's concerns um, and, I, and I don't necessarily disagree with them, but how I read this and how I, how I would uh, I think we should read it is in, in my view, like that ship has sailed. We, we have these things in place already. And so what, what this is doing is saying the programs are here, they're not going away and we're not going to change that, but we support them. We support the tax credits, property tax exemption, citing, you know, just reading the summary like we're not going to change the fact that we have the the standards but if we have them i think it's best for agriculture to be able to say yeah we have them but let's offset some of the increased costs with with some other stuff tax credits on and on so that's how i view this again appreciate sam but disagree with her a little bit Thank you, Tyson. Do we have further uh, discussion? 
Okay, there's a motion on the floor to approve this uh, resolution. It's been moved and seconded. Um, I think it's, we'll try for just a voice vote and see what happens. So all in favor, say aye. 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 Stephanie, it looks like you're frozen. Aye. Opposed? Any thank you work group? Did somebody want to? Okay, we're moving on to resolution 275, Cougar Management Plan. Uh, obviously, people heard a lot of comment today. We heard from ODFW. Um, I would entertain a motion in order to start the discussion. This is Elon, so moved. Okay. Is there a, and, and you are moving approval of the resolution, is that correct, Elon? Thank you. Yes. Um, is there a second? This is Grant, I second that. Okay, Grant Kitamura seconds. So now for discussion. So Barbara Boyer, um, I have a quick question. I see that um, next year we will be reviewing, or the work group A, we'll be reviewing um, resolution 298, which is the, uh, what are they calling it? I'm sorry. The um, the wolf coexistence of wolves and livestock on Oregon's rural landscape. Yes, I have a question for the work group. Did did you overlap those two at all and see if they? Mm. I'm just trying to figure out if maybe they're they're very similar. I have not had a chance to read 298, but I see it's coming up. Um, we we didn't actually talk about overlap or parallels between those two. Okay, I'd be curious if um, if they would be a similar resolution. Well, I'll take a quick look as the group is discussing. Okay, thank you. It might it may have been in the packet. I didn't. I don't have it in front of me, but I think Carla mm -hmm. sent all the resolutions that are going to be up for consideration in your packet. So if you want to dig, um, uh, let's see. I had it thought that I lost, which is common these days. Oh, I know what it was. Um, the, you know, some of the comment, comment, commenters offered to bring in um, other experts on this issue. And, you know, from time to time, the board has decided to not, to postpone taking action on a resolution so you can hear from more people. So I just want to, since we're in discussion right now, put that on the table that it, it's possible that we do not have to take an action. We could request further presentations if we want them. So I just wanted to note that. And anybody who is not speaking or doesn't want to speak, don't forget to mute your mic so we don't get feedback. Does anybody else want to comment on this. Barbara, do you need an answer from Stephanie before you can opine one way or the other? No, it was just more of an observation. And um, maybe when the work group comes together in 2021, um, maybe comparing those two. OK. Any further comments on this? Yes, um, Shantae Johnson. Um, I was looking through a lot of the public comment and trying to look at what were some possible solutions um, from the opposing side, and it was hard to find besides just using non-lethal approaches. Um, and so, you know, I would be interested in hearing a little bit more research and also solutions um, around what would be the best approach to modify this resolution. Um, so there's just a lot of public comment about like we should not approve the resolution, but there's not any concrete concrete approaches or ways to to modify it. Um, 
So I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more. I do realize that this has been a lengthy process because there's a lot of uh, interest in the, in the Cougar management plan, but I, do, you know, I, I would be interested in actually hearing a little bit more research from a different perspective. Um, and I do agree that okay. it does, we do need to have some kind of compromise from both sides um, because at the same time, ranchers are also having to protect their livestock. Um, and so I'd be interested in hearing for both parties, what would be a, a compromise for the both of them? Okay, are there further comments? Um, Chairman Halleck. Uh, Go ahead. Okay, let's take, uh, let's take Elin and then Josh. Okay. Um, uh, I had the opportunity to to reach out to just some local ranchers and actually on our vineyard, um, we still have quite a, quite a bit of acreage where a neighbor runs their sheep. And uh, I think in addition to that, uh, you know, I appreciated the, the public comments we received. Um, and uh, I also was very impressed um, with what uh, ODFW had to say Dennis's presentation and I think the science behind that. I, I just know from a from a personal standpoint as well as neighboring ranches, um, just for our own in our own situation, we have had in the last few years ten ewes, ten pregnant ewes, and a dozen lambs uh, taken by mountain lion. And so when I at least said, hey, what do people think about the the uh, Oregon uh, or the uh, Cougar management? program and they were all just oh my gosh so supportive of what was going on so at least what i was hearing we heard from more of the cattle folks and less of the sheep folks and i was hearing a lot from sheep folks because obviously sheep are even more vulnerable so so that's why i my thought would be that we need to move forward on uh supporting this resolution it's supporting our livestock i do think it may make some sense to bring somebody back in later to see if there's some other augmentation we might think about um, if there's some other avenues that that agriculture could look at. So that would be my thought. Okay, Josh, did you have something you'd like to add? Yeah, I also uh, really, I thought that Derek from the Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife's presentation was really well-rounded and considered a lot of viewpoints. Um, so, you know, knowing that our support of of their management program isn't the end all be all you know it's just it's just that it's just support um i think one thing that was kind of missing from all the different stats or i didn't see it um in the packet or in anyone's stats today that were said was what's the financial impact of of uh these predators on livestock is it you know it we saw a number of incidences we saw a number of uh, conflicts um, and takes and things like that but we never saw any financial numbers so i was just kind of curious if that's something significant or not uh stephanie do you know anything about that or is that really an odfw question um, that that would be an ODFW question, so I'm glad to follow up and, and find out. All right, is there further discussion on the motion um, on the table? Tyson? <clears throat> yeah, again, Tyson Raymond. Um, so I, I, I feel like I understand and um, appreciate a lot of the concerns in the in the entries into the public comment that we received um, appreciate them and it really helped me to kind of think about stuff coming from eastern oregon you're you usually approach things in one direction so i i really appreciated it um that being said what i saw in the presentation was in nearly every zone the carrying capacity is nearly I mean, it, it's 90% or better. So we're north of that. We're in the last 30 years since the original implementation of this plan, um, we've more than doubled the cougars, uh, the the number of cougars in the <clears throat> in in the state. Um, I while I I understand and appreciate the comment that 
there needs to be solutions and we need to look at solutions. I, I wholeheartedly agree, but I think that that lies primarily with the people that write the, the management plan, which is ODF and W, right? Like we're here as a board, um, the Department of Ag, and what this resolution does is just say <clears throat> there's really smart people that take in a, a lot of factors to, to benefit society, agriculture, the wolves, the cougars, the, you know, and I mean, they're taking a holistic approach and they write this management plan. And so looking at it from what I perceive my job to be is on the board of ag, balancing that with, with agriculture. And I think, I believe that ODF and W did a comprehensive job with all of the stakeholders you can see it in the cougar population over the last 30 years so i would recommend we support the resolution and in the future when they change it if it doesn't benefit agriculture if it doesn't if we don't feel like it's walking that balance uh, then we revisit it at that time all right further comments discussion Mr. Uh Stephanie, yes, this is right. Grant. <clears throat> you know, I'd just like to uh, pretty much uh, say the same thing Tyson said. I think we have to remember that uh, as the Board of Ag, we are ag advocates, first of all. And secondly, uh, I think the, the best experts for uh, wildlife management in the state is ODFW. So uh, I, I don't think we have much of a choice here. I don't think you're ever going to have 100% agreement on any of this. But uh, I, I, I support the resolution because I think it's the best thing to do for the moment. Thank you, Grant. Uh, further co comments from the board members? Brian, did you want to say something? Yeah, Brian Harper here. I, I just agree with everybody. I think if we didn't support it, for one, we'd have a whole slew of other comments coming from the ag side. Um, ODF and W has been at this for a long time. And just from my personal perspective, down my way there in Junction City, uh, we have cougars. There are cougars out there in, in our area, of course. Um, but we had our first sighting here this earlier this week, um, and uh, we hadn't had one in probably 10 or 15 years. And if there's one, there's usually more. And we have a lot of sheep down that way. We have a lot of, we have a lot of grass seed, a lot of especially annual ryegrass, um, despite a lot of specialty seed crops down there. And uh, predation is definitely a real thing. So um, I definitely support. Uh, farmers having tools to take care of business when they need it, but uh, um, yeah, it's, it's I think it's worth hearing. I think down the line, but I think we should support the resolution. Thank you, Brian. Anybody else want to weigh in before we take action? Okay, um, I will try a voice vote, and we may have to call the roll depending on how it goes. So there is a resolution, or excuse me, a motion, and it's been seconded to adopt this uh, resolution as proposed by the work group. Um, so all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the resolution is adopted. Thank you all very much. We are on to the Native Plant Conservation Program, Resolution 305. That would be Ms. Page again, I believe. Hello, Stephanie. There she is. Um, yes, so this, um, this is the one that was reworded since the last board meeting um, so that it wasn't it it was previously worded to support funding for the native plant program and I think one of the discussion points last night was theoretically you could do a resolution in support of um, of all ODA funding for all ODA programs so the resolution was revised to um, ex to acknowledge the statutorily mandated um, 
direction or, or charge of the program. So the, the work group's recommendation was to adopt this revised resolution. Okay, um, I have a question, and I'm sorry to do this. I, I, maybe Lisa's still on. It, where is this program on the program priority list? Because it seems a little weird if the board adopts a resolution supporting this program and it's like a low priority on the program priority list. And I can't, my eyes aren't good enough <laughs> to tell you. I can't see it. So maybe somebody can find it for me. So, um, Chair Halleck, I am looking for it. This is this program has had kind of a long and sorted history in terms of bud budgetary issues over time. It's one that's lower down on the priority list a lot because it's a very small program um, in, in our agency. It's not a lot of money um, and has some significant responsibilities, but in terms of getting stable funding for this, it's been challenging throughout my career. It's bounced back and forth from having some general fund to having some lottery fund to being all on federal funds to go get grants, but then we couldn't do the statutory work. So it's, it's just one of those very challenging statutory requirements that we have out there, along with all the other things we try to balance in natural resources, but it's down towards I, I the lower end. Yeah, I think it is, was pretty far down. I can't find it either, but um, Steph, could you maybe remind us why this was 2010, why the board felt so strongly at that time that we wanted to adopt a resolution having to do with a particular ODA program? Um, I'm going to actually... I think Helmet yeah. or Lauren would probably be best to answer that because um, they were, I think, involved in that. So I think I hear Lauren trying to speak. Yeah. Um, so um, at, Lauren, at that would you time, say who um, you are? Lauren. Oh, I'm who are sorry. You? Lauren Henderson, Assistant Director, at Department of Agriculture. Um, uh, as you know, many things that are related to our programs uh, come and go with uh, budget problems. Um, and we were coming out of 2008, a program is the little program that could, um, and I say that affectionately because they have a pretty defined statutory mandate, um, and um, a part of that is that people, if you think about um, Oregon SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office, you can't dig or do things like that without getting a permit from them um, for uh, preservation purposes, like think archaeology and those kinds of things. This program is that same thing, only for uh, native plants. And so if you're doing some construction or those things, you have to either have a consult through this program or a specific permit to, one, do an analysis. Are there any native plants? in the area that you're disturbing. And if there are, can that be mitigated, um, either moved or a plan to replant or propagate or preserve that species? Uh, without the funding to do the state work, uh, it could be seen that those projects cannot move forward. And I have lots of examples, but I won't give that to you today. Um, at the time the board did this, it was a little um, unusual, I'll just say that, um, but they felt pretty strongly and the administrator, Dan Hilburn, felt pretty strongly that somebody needed to say something about the importance of the program and that it should not have its funding um, up and down and cut because of the reason I gave you. Fast forward to today, um, the board certainly um, would have to consider a precedent for doing that because you potentially could get asked by for 38 of our program, given the challenges that the state has, to do board resolutions about every single program that we have and what that really means. This resolution as it's written now really just, I think, says this program has a place, it's important, um, and the board is just making that statement that it is an important program. 
Does that help? Um, it does help. I think I sort of, um, I probably should have done what I did on the other two was ask for a motion before we got into the discussion, but you know, I'm not too good on Robert's rules of order. Go ahead, Lisa. So it's um, number 30 out of 37 programs in the agency. I found it in the small print. So um, I would, now I have to say, since you're on Helmuth, would you like to say anything? No, Lauren covered it all. And, and this was um, going back a while because we had some changes. So the, the program lead, Dr. Bob Meinke, who took the program to where it is now um, many years ago. And he's actually, the program is housed at OSU in Corvallis. And so there were some changes. He retired last year, I think. remember um, exactly. Uh, and so there were some changes that we had to um, adapt because he was able to do some of the, ma the statutorily mandated work with the funding that he created out of the federal funds. And um, that wasn't um, what we used the funds for. So that's where we went with the, um, the resolution saying, hey, we need state funding to do the state mandatory stuff. But again, as Lauren described, we have lots of um, state mandatory programs. Look at our Noxus Weed program has a, a mandate and there's no funding. So that's that's where we, well, we didn't want, we want to be consistent um, across the board for all the programs and say, okay, yes, the board recognizes that obviously all of the programs are important and uh, some of them have mandates. Uh, but we don't want to put the board into a position that they ask for a one specific program for funding. I hope okay, that. Thank, thank you, Helmut. So just to be clear, if you all take a look at this again, um, the references to um, funding are, we're, it's just a statement of support for the program. It's not a request for funding or anything. So now I would entertain a motion for resolution 305. Barbara Boyer, I so move. Thank you, Barbara. Yes. Is it a, is there a second? Yes, I second. Louisa, thank you. All right, uh, all in favor of uh, adopting this resolution or continuing, or I guess adopting the new language in this resolution, say aye, please. Aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Um, may I ask a question? Yeah. Of course you may, Louisa. Helmut, is there any program right now? Is there any research or some program in this area? Something that is supported that something is going on right now? About na native plants or? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. I, I think uh, Louisa asked if there is anybody doing any kind of research right. on, in this or work in this. I think you might have said Oregon State is. Is that correct, Helmut? Yeah. So, so the program. Sorry, sorry. This is Helmut Drog, Oregon Department of Agriculture. Um, the program is housed at OSU in Corvallis on the campus, and that had to do because with Bob Menke, he used to be an, an, an associate professor or something like this with OSU, and he was offered um, offices there, and so that's where he that's where he is. So the reason also it is there because um, our program takes advantage of the greenhouse capacity that OSU has on the campus because we are trying to um, 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 grow some of those um, threatened and endangered plants at the greenhouse and they do, they do testing. So se several students went through the program and, and had their thesis done in our native program with Bob Menke as mentor and their, um, as a professor. So this is changing a little bit because the current lead is not yet a, um, he's not on that level, he doesn't have a PhD. Um, so we still have the connection with OSU um, for the facilities and uh, the capacity. And plus the, the Arboretum is there and all the collections that our program it's a good fit for 
Uh, with, what is the department that is in charge of that horticulture or what are the plant pathology? It's, she asked um, if it's I horticulture. know where it is in the... It, okay, no, that's okay. That's yeah, just I, 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 how is that program? I know. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Wait, Whatever you, building that was just... Helma, could you find out and let Louisa know? Yeah, whatever. Okay, yeah. Okay, I will let you know. Thank you. All right. So just for the record, the motion passed. So the resolution is adopted. So the last bit of business we have on resolutions is please look in your packet. There are um, two work groups being formed. Carla needs you to email which work group that um, you want to be on. Stephanie Page and Helmut are uh, going to lead work group A, which has to do with pesticide use, soil and water conservation, cost share, uh, our involvement, board's involvement in OWEB, and coexistence with wolves. And then work group B is going to be led by Jim Johnson and Isaac and Jess. Um, documented agricultural workforce, collective bargaining for ag workers. Permitted uses, it's, this is a, kind of a land use thing. Permitted uses on lands, uh, zoned EFU, working lands, conservation easements, federal minimum wage parity, and uh, ODA's role in FISMA. This is all in your packet, so please let Carla know um, which work group you want to be on. And then um, she, between Director Taylor and Carla, if we have an uneven number of people signing up, they will just have to decide for us who's going to be on which work group. And before we get to newsletter topics, Grant Kitamura, I think you have something that you would like to share with us. Yes, thank you, uh, Stephanie. Well, it's sad to say, but uh, this is my last board meeting. Um, I am uh, moving to Idaho on January 1st, and you have to be a citizen of a resident of Oregon to be on this board and I really appreciate all the fellowship and friendship friendships over the years for maybe a year and a half I don't know how long it's been but uh, I'm sure our paths will cross somewhere down the road and uh, I enjoyed working with you it's uh, it's been a lot of fun and uh, just want to thank you well, Grant, we are really, really sorry to see you go, but totally understand. And we didn't even get to make you a video or do anything. <laughs> so you might you might get something sent to you when you're in Idaho as a little bit of memorabilia. And um, mm. I don't know, Director Taylor, if you want to share with the board what happens um, since this is sort of a transition in the middle of somebody's term. And I don't know if we've ever dealt with that before. Uh, uh, Chair Halleck, thank you. This is Alexis Taylor. Um, first, I just want to say thank you so much to Grant for, I think, the two years that you've been on the board. I'm very sad to see you go. I think you have been such a wonderful uh, board member. Um, I know I have personally really appreciated the insight um, that you have shown, the leadership you've shown, so I'm very sad to see you go. Um, but but understand and excited for what is next uh, for you uh, personally in your life. So just thank you so much um, for everything that you've done the past two years and you will be sorely, sorely missed by myself. And I know that I'm speaking for all of ODA's leadership team. Thank you for those kind words. And uh, I just want to add that uh, my business isn't going to Oregon. It's going to stay here. When I say I'm going to, or it's not going to Idaho, when I said I'm going to Idaho, I'm moving two miles. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but at any rate, um, and my business has always enjoyed an excellent partnership with ODA and will continue to do so. In fact, Casey Prentice and his group have worked so hard this fall, shorthanded through the COVID without complaining. And I know that poor guy's worked double shifts. He needs to be commended. And uh, uh, they've done a wonderful job. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Well, Grant, we expect if we ever get to have an in-person meeting out in, in Ontario, we expect you to come as an honored guest. Oh, certainly, certainly. You don't even have to get that close. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, I think, Carla, if I'm correct, we just have to talk about the news topic for the newsletters. I, I suppose we are going to have to put in there that we're losing Grant, much as I hate to. Um, no, oh, and did you, Director Taylor, did you want to share with the board what happens next at this uh, point, we'll if be, you know? Um, well, so I'll be working, we'll be working with the governor on um, exactly how we're going to fill Grant's um, seat, but uh, somebody will be appointed by the governor um, to fill out the remaining term, um, and then they would obviously have the opportunity to potentially be reappointed for a second term. But if the, whoever is appointed will um, be appointed to fill out the remaining term. Okay. Okay. So the newsletter, I presume we put something in there about that. Um, and board members, other suggested topics for the. We usually include action on resolutions i think we usually include that in the newsletter um welcome to Bar our new members um, yep. do we, barbara yeah. boyer that's a, barbara boyer that's what i wanted to add was welcoming our two new board members okay anything uh, do we need anything on the um the presentation from the panel on um that we probably should have a little something on the presentation from the panel and this is a newsletter, uh, Director Taylor, could you just, um, for the new board members, let them know what the distribution of this newsletter is and sort of where it came from? Yeah, so in statute, um, it says uh, with the creation of the board, there's a um, biennial report that the board needs to do to the legislature. And it used to be a very thick booklet. Um, a few years ago, we have gone to a more updated, shorter version, and so we still do a biennial report, but it's only, it's usually like a trifold, interesting pictures, and um, um, I, for the new board members, we had shared it with you as you were going through the um, pro application process. Um, but then in addition to that, since it is much more pared down, at the end of each um, board meeting after the uh, each board meeting we do a newsletter the primary audience is the legislature um, to update them on what we've done so it's more, much more timely um, than the previous just every two years um, but it, it gets shared broader than that many you know to ag stakeholders or who's ever signed up on the board of ag distribution list um, but the primary audience again is the legislature to meet those uh, requirements for um, reporting to the legislature on the board activities. Okay, so did we miss anything, Carla, uh, that we should be having in, um, do you, I, I suppose since the governor's recommended budget just came out, is there anything you want to say about the impacts on, okay, <clears throat> in the budget? Should we have that? Yeah, one thing we can do since we still will have a bit more info, get gathering of information because we're still really digging into it. We normally, uh, we do kind of a two-pager budget summary that's easy to look at at what you know, it's happened the past few bienniums from um, our recommend, or um, the governor's recommended budget to the current budget we have for the, this biennium. And we will share that with the board um, once we develop that, once we have time to read kind of some of the specifics. And maybe we just link to that in the board report as an attachment. So it's not because it's a couple pages as is. Okay. And um, our next meeting is is coming up soon. It's January 19th and 20th before the legislative session starts, right? Okay. Correct. Well, um, on Tuesday evening, the 19th, we'll convene work groups to start work on um, that next set of resolutions. And then our full board meeting will be on Wednesday, January 20th. Okay, Carla or Director Taylor, have I forgotten anything? I just see, I thought Elin had something, maybe. Oh. I was I was just, for the newsletter, and you may have covered it in the previous newsletter, but all the work that, that the Oregon Department of Ag has done on all the COVID stuff um, has been, you know, tremendous. You may have highlighted it already, but I think a mention of that, you had it in your report, but I think a mention of that would be important too. Okay, anybody else have anything for the good of the order? Okay, thank you very much. We are hereby adjourned. Thank you, Stephanie. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.